That's another issue. That's not today. No, nothing to do with it. <laughs> I can't see. I can't see. It's ever approving. Essentially, I want to sit out the first one, and he's going to sit out the second one, so he's falling down. Good evening, everybody. You can you hear me? Oh, there we go. So welcome to the uh, January, what is the day? 15th uh, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting for Weathersfield. Would the clerk help me with the roll call, please? Chairman Harley. Here. Uh, clerk Roberts is here. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Oichel. Here. Mr. Hammer. No. Mr. Homicki. Yes. Mr. Dean. Here. Mr. Allard. Here. Mr. Silver. Here. Mr. Edwards. Here. Ms. Antoniak. Yes. All right. So we have 10 of us here tonight. Only nine can play in the sandbox at a time. Uh, let me take the first first one, and I, I think somebody's going to recuse themselves. Public hearing application number 2002-18-Z. Tucker Lee seeking a special permit in accordance with section 5.2.A.2 for mixed use. And section 6.2-D5, parking space reduction and landscape waiver of the zoning regs at 249 Main Street. This is continued from December. Is the applicant here? There I'm gonna are. recuse myself on this. All right, thank you. So, so that makes nine of us and we're all participating, all right? Good evening, nice to have you back. Um, so why don't we start with a brief intro uh, introduction of yourselves and the project again and kind of where we left off. Sure thing. Good evening and thank you for having us again. For those of you who are unfamiliar, my name is Tucker Lee and I am accompanied by my fiance, Dr. Marcy Berman. Both she and I attended Planning and Zoning's December 4th, 2018 meeting to address necessary requirements related to rezoning our property 249 Main Street, also known as the Belden House. As we were addressing potential modifications related to rezoning our house to its original mixed zone status, additional details were requested from the committee. To address those concerns, we had also hired our sur surveyor, Flynn and Sear, to make sure that our easement map was accurate. To address these comments, we, the owners, and our architect, Jan Woyas, and civil engineer, Ozzy Torres, have worked diligently, collaborating with the town planner, Peter Gillespie, on the best methods to address the committee's concerns. First, to address the concerns related to our parking lot, we have received approval to construct our lot through the historic district. We have also discussed the plans regarding construction with both of our surrounding neighbors, including um, <clears throat> the owners on Church Street and the Masonic Home. We have discussed the easement with the Gettles lawyers, one of whom is here today. With the committee's permission, we hope to begin phase one of our construction April 2019 and project the completion of that phase by the end of September. We recognize the efforts of the members of this committee who have been very encouraging and sympathetic to our needs as a family. Thank you for your support. We would like to address the new comments from the town planner and town engineer in order if you could please read them to us. Have you, have you seen them? 
Yes, we have. Okay, so <laughs> as I read them, it's not like you're going to yes. um, answer oh. them on the fly. Uh, and that's good. This is, we're actually seeing them for the first time as well. So first one is a portion of the proposed parking lot, parking area is shown on the abutting property. Um, identify if an easement modification is proposed to include this area because it should be shown accurately on the plans. So bottom line is have you got an easement area now that it's consistent with the construction operations for the parking lot? Is that how you want to do it, or you just want the town engineer to respond, uh, the town engineer, listen to me, to your engineer to respond to him? Right, excuse me, for the record, my name is Ozzie Torres, I'm the engineer of record. Um, I have offices here in uh, Wethersfield, Connecticut. Um, yes, this is the first comment by the um, town engineer, and um, we have inf uh, an agreement, basically, with the abutters that that will be extended, but, but the attorney felt that we shouldn't show that extension until it's all agreed upon and um, not recalculated at this time. But they said that we are allowed to move to one foot away from the southern property line, which is against the Masonic Temple property. Now, you may have something to show them that, do you have a letter or anything? So, so let me just describe what the, what the commission's gonna think in a general sense, right? We're gonna be, uh, okay to, to conceptualize a potential improvement uh, approval here contingent upon uh, finalization or acceptance of all the comments by the town engineer and staff right That's and fine. so if you're telling us that the first comment is all about making the easement consistent with the co construction plans and you believe that's going to be able to be done Absolutely. because you have you know a verbal with the property owner thank you that'll okay that would address that all right wonderful do you want to go to the second comment then? sure Uh, the improvement location survey identifies the limits of the existing easement on 263 Main Street. However, since traffic flow in one direction from Main Street, add a note uh, clarifying, so they wish us to add a note clarifying the rights of egress across 263 to Church Street, and we will add that note. And the uh, butters have agreed to let us do that. And as a matter of fact, it's already on, on the land records that they have a right to go all the way to Church Street. It's just that we had never submitted that to you. Okay. Number three, silt fence is still shown on the property. Uh, again, the 263 property, and they agreed to let us have the silt fence there. It's all also, we'll put it on the plan, um, and they were just looking for the amount of time that it would be there, and we told them that it would be uh, until September when the, the uh, grass around that disturbed little area would be uh, reestablished. All right. Um, right, number four, the parking extends to one foot on the southerly property line, and, um, and he's worried about snow removal. We showed a, a, an area where we removed one of the parking spaces, and it shows on the plan as being for snow removal, and we will not allow the plow to push snow into the abutting property. Um, we're also going to try and get an agreement with them that allows us for if the snow just happens to fall there. Okay. So you re so you removed <coughs> you removed one parking space from the plan. We removed one the parking way. space because of another yeah. comment by the engineering yeah. uh, that it was too tight and they couldn't turn around. Number five, uh, at a, a note stating that the contract should take care not to damage existing brick pavers. Um, or, or repairing and all broken or damaged sidewalk in front of the property will be repaired. Yes, we, we will add that note. Mm -hmm. Number six, uh, revise the general utility note uh, as permit approvals and standards. Yes, we will revise that note. That's just a, a small um, job. Revise the permanent trench repair detail. This was the, um, the details supplied to us by the town, and we will revise it. Uh, just He wants a little change in, in the title and so on. And finally, number eight, the standard planning zoning commission approval block to be uh, uh, put on the uh, improvement survey, and we will put that uh, approval block there. So, 
So, so I <clears throat> understand it is your intent to comply with everything that uh, Dick Gregor, the town engineer, has proposed. Absolutely. We'll take care of it in the plans. All right. Now, Peter had some comments as well, I believe. Um, he's looking for a copy of the approved easement when it gets done. And uh, he's looking for details of the proposed pavers. Um, yes, if I can comment on that. The pavers that were installed in Comstock, the detail of that is the same detail that we're using here. What happened is that at the front of that installation process, they use a different sand. So, and I was not involved in, in watching the construction there, but the pavers are identical. The, the difference is that they use brick and we're gonna use block. Right. And we will make that a, a detail available on the plan. Thank you. Uh, details of the lighting and ensuring that it's in compliance with the full cutoff we'll add it. requirements. We'll also add that to the plan and I believe we submitted that with the packet, the, the mm -hmm. actual details. All right, and then the last one is uh, proposed phasing. Oh, I have Everyone. a copy for each of you. And could you just kind of summarize what it suggests? Uh, sure. Um, in regards to the, um, the uses as a business, we will be adding the fire separation as noted on the floor plans and install the smoke and CO detectors as required by the fire marshal. Um, those will be part of phase one. Um, for the outside, we will also construct a handicap ramp on the south entrance, adjust and install the west side walkways in order for uh, a handicap um, user to enter both sides of the, the building, uh, dig the gravel bed, add pavers for handicap parking, install the directional sign, and install lights. Okay. The uh, fire marshal has indicated that he has no additional comments as of yesterday. So Peter, have in your mind, are there other issues that you anticipate the uh, applicant requiring before I turn it over to the commission? Uh, no, I think most of these um, comments from both the town engineer and myself can be uh, handled as a series of um, conditions. Um, and if there is uh, phasing um, included in the occupancy of the building, uh, our typical standard practice is that any remaining improvements <coughs> that aren't done at the time a temporary CO is issued have to be bonded so that there's some guarantees that the work uh, will uh, in a timely manner be constructed. So uh, that's the only caveat I had as it relates to any, any phasing that you might um, uh, be willing to um, grant. And then lastly, <coughs> there are two waivers uh, being requested here. One is for the parking. Uh, so they are um, deficient by two spaces based on the parking calculations. And then secondly, they are asking for um, some relief from some of your landscaping uh, requirements. There is a landscaping um, plan included in the site plan. So they, they are proposing some additional landscaping, but it doesn't meet the full uh, extent of your regulations, so uh, they would be asking for those two waivers as well. So if anyone makes a motion, what do you mean by full extent? Cut up the signage? All of the standard parking area island requirements. They've proposed, I think, four additional trees in addition to uh, the vegetation that exists out there now. And I know you've okay. you've been out there. So um, <laughs> they originally had some landscape the existing vegetation. Yeah, that's fine. And, and they're adding they're some trees. Out a couple, maybe, yeah, uh, yeah there's t they're taking out one in particular for the handicap ramp and some of the sidewalks. Uh, yeah. They had originally proposed some landscaping just off of the property on the Comstock Ferry property, but I believe in the conversations with the representatives of Comstock, uh, they uh, requested that that be uh, removed and they try and uh, provide that parking um, on site. Yeah, there was a tree, I think, off to the... There was a, yeah, a couple, yeah. couple of, yeah, so... Uh, has has the uh, the um, area to the north where the big tree is, uh, the parking there and everything resolved as far yes. as staffing is concerned? Yes, that has been removed uh, as you had requested on, on one of the items. Uh, What's been removed? The, the space that was, there? yes, the parking space that was. So that's not one of your. That's your, not one of our that's spaces. That's what I thought. 
No, it's been removed. We, we, we took care of that. And there's still comments in here, and I was wondering about it, but not, maybe not tonight. I, I may add one more thing, Peter. Um, the architect has done some revised calculations for the building, and he's got it down to about 7.4 spaces required. Uh, we'll submit that along as part of our revisions, but it still needs a waiver. We're, we're going to have, it's almost eight spaces, I assume, at 7.4, so we're going to ask only for seven. So so how many are you providing again? I was we're providing ask. seven. You're providing seven. But, it, but it's not required. We've calculated it so that it's not required to be nine. It, it's more like 7.4. Okay. And, and we can submit those calculations to you, of course. So you're providing right. seven and you're required to provide eight? Yes. Okay. Correct. Right. Thank you. So, so Peter, I, I don't see a specific reference to a, um, a specific thing in the zoning regs in, as far as the landscaping is concerned. <coughs> uh, is there one or? Is There's a, a series of landscaping requirements for the perimeter, for the parking lots, for a, a number of things. So um, they are, in essence, asking you to approve the landscaping as uh, included in the, <coughs> in the plan. Your regulations do allow you to grant that kind of relief um, with consideration to the existing um, yep. landscaping that uh, is on the property. So that's what they're with, asking. Without specific reference to not meeting A, B, C, D. They do e. reference in the table which provisions they don't meet. So it's in the, it's in the notes on the landscaping calculations. Ah. Okay, very good. Thank you. Other questions for the applicant? If you're all set, I'll turn it over to public comment for a moment. Is there anybody from the public who wishes to comment on this plan? Yes, sir. Would you please come up and join us? I think I remember you. <laughs> yeah, good evening. I'm attorney Matthew Willis. I represent Baker Creek, or as you've referred to it, Comstock. Um, we've reached an agreement regarding this amended easement uh, for the essential terms with the building house owners. Uh, it's going to extend the uh, existing easement to bring it one foot from the, the Masonic property. Um, the easement is designed to grant the building house egress and ingress to the property and access to their uh, parking spots. Um, Baker Creek reserves the right to change the location of the easement as long as the building house has ingress and egress and it doesn't impact their parking spaces. Um, we will work out internal parking and direction signs amongst ourselves with staff input. And the northernmost parking spaces are, sp I think, split between two surfaces and when the time comes, hopefully we'll resolve that when they choose their paver and with input from the staff. Um, there's a couple other little things, and one is that there shouldn't be any vehicular access in the easement area regarding the brick walkway immediately north of the building. And you know, I don't think that's the intent, but that's just so there's no um, traffic going the wrong way, uh, no conflicts. So basically, um, this you know the. Comstack is willing to say that this application can be approved subject to a signed amended easement agreement between the parties, and that's one of the items that was set forth. Yes. Unless I lose my common sense, you think a signage you'll come up with for the whole parking area and the direction, and that kind of thing was brought out at the hearing, uh, and I think I was concerned with it. Do you think that'll be resolved? I think so, yes. Okay. Good. It'll be a lot better than it is now, and it doesn't really hit, say much of anything out there. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else from the public who wishes to speak on this application? All righty. So I'm going to take this opportunity just to tell you a little bit about how the process works in a public hearing. <coughs> this is your last opportunity. What's going to end up happening is we're going to take it back and we're probably gonna to vote to close the hearing and when that happens, we cannot take any more additional public input. So if there's anybody who wants to speak, now's your time. All right. Move to close the public hearing. 
Uh, do you want to talk? Do you want? Oh, oh, we had a oh, hand. Oh, we had a hand. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Could you, could you join us at the microphone? This this is only okay. So let me go all the way back. This is one application. Uh, are you, this is the application for the the property as I started at the opening. <clears throat> it's it has nothing to do with the Middletown Avenue project. It has to do with, only with application number two zero zero two dash eighteen dash Z. This is a special permit for 249 Main Street. That's all, okay? The night is young. Yeah, the night's young. If you're here for the second issue. <laughs> all righty, all righty. <coughs> so we, uh, we have a motion up here to close the hearing. Do we want to hear it from the applicant first before any response? questions for the applicant? Why don't, you, why don't you come on up here and join us just before we close this? Because I just I just want to make sure that what you heard from the lawyer at the from the Comstock property and I apologize I'm not using the proper term but um, are you okay with what you heard from from them? Absolutely, right. it's exactly what we discussed before. All right, then I have a motion to close and a second for Jim. Everybody okay with that? Yep. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous. So, so thank you. All right, so let's have a discussion about this. What we're, what we're talking about here is a waiver for parking. Uh, apparently it's one spot, maybe, you know, arguably two. Um, and we kind of talked about that last time around on, on a personal level. I, you know, there's enough parking issues, enough parking elsewhere, maybe not adjacent to the property per se, uh, that I'm not overly concerned personally about mm -hmm. one or two mm -hmm. spots regardless of how the math works. I think others had other opinions, um, but that's mine. Mr. Chairman, I, I'll comment. Yeah, I at one point I was getting concerned it was too too little, but not really. And in fact, I'm on the bicycle and uh, walking subcommittee the other night here in town hall, and uh, someone brought up the fact that down there, what are our regulations on parking in town and that kind of thing. And the person was uh, sharp enough to bring out the fact that, you know, of course there are parking spots out on the street and all that kind of thing. And I think one spot is not a big problem with this. So getting it uh, to seven uh, and requiring eight, uh, I think is satisfactory to me. And that was the primary issue I had in the latter parts of this hearing. During the last go round, I was the one who raised most of the objection as to parking. And uh, after further review of the project as a whole, um, and giving more time to the area, I, no, I think it's fine. I have no objection uh, right. to the exception for parking. So, <clears throat> and maybe I could have asked for additional clarification from the applicant, it's too late now, but uh, they mentioned an April 1st start. In your mind, Peter, is there some reason why April 1st is anything like time critical for us? I mean, I think they'd like to start construction um, uh, April on the, the exterior improvements, but between now and April, I think they would like to occupy <coughs> part of the commercial space, assuming that it meets uh, fire and building codes. And in, in that scenario, uh, since the public, the, the, the site improvements would not be completed at that point, they would have to provide an agreement with us uh, about bonding uh, for those improvements as we would typically do with anybody who has not uh, completed their uh, public improvements or, or site improvements uh, and at the same time wants to get a, a temporary certificate of occupancy. So that's the only caveat. Uh, obviously, it's winter time. Is that a condition or I would a ask, so it's, it's I would ask that to be a condition for uh, providing staff with the guidance because normally we would okay. not do that. Right. Would you, what's the wording? I'll, I'm, put I'm putting a few notes together and I'll, I'll give you a suggested oh. motion in just, just a, few, a few minutes here. Okay. <coughs> At a minimum, it's going to be incorporating the comments or addressing the comments put forth by the town engineer in a memo, and, and maybe we can go over this. Is there anybody who'd like to make a motion, and then we can kind of craft it as we're going? I'll make a motion to approve application number 2002-18Z for a special permit for 249 Main Street in concert with parking space reductions and landscape waivers. Uh, of the Weatherfield zoning regulations 
in addition to the eight bullets as noted and clarified by the applicant from our town engineer and the three <coughs> notations as given by our town planner. Um, yep. That works for me. That covers the January 15th letter, <coughs> January 15th memo from the town engineer and the and January 14th uh, memo from Peter Glass planner. Okay, very good. Thank you. And then just um, uh, the last two would be to approve the uh, uh, phasing um, phasing of the construction, assuming uh, all um, fire and uh, building code uh, is satisfied with uh, uh, a method of proper bonding being provided to the town, and then additionally that the final uh, easement agreement uh, is provided to the town. As noted within yep. these four documents. Yep. Yes, I'll accept that as a motion. All right. I'll and second. Thank you. And, and Peter, you'll work on the wording with the secretary yep. to uh, come will. up with something nice and clean. Yep. Tom, did you have some comments you wanted to make? Uh, no, only only to the extent that uh, uh, the conditions will include the, the comments just uh, articulated by the town planner. Uh, which uh, amends uh, slightly the original motion, and I second it as amended. Okay. Any additional topics for discussion? Otherwise, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Is there anybody opposed? Unanimous. Let's go get it done. <laughs> okay. Chairman, I'm going to recuse myself from the next. All right, thank you very much. Moving on to the second item, and uh, for the record, Dan Silver has excused himself, and uh, Rich Roberts has rejoined us. The second item on the agenda is item 3.1, a public hearing for application 2005-18-Z. This is Maple Street 24 LLC, seeking a change of zone from residence C to business park for properties at 159 and 165 Middletown Avenue. This too is continued from a December meeting. So, um, based on the question, yeah, if the applicant could, um, could come up and join us, um, and based on the question I heard earlier. So, in total, we are opening this, or we are continuing this public hearing. It was open on the previous meeting. It is continued to this one. So we are open to public comment. We're gonna let the uh, applicant uh, fill us in with anything more that has come about on their side since the last time we met. Then we will ask some questions. Uh, when we are done asking questions, we'll turn it over to the public to let them uh, question, have questions, offer questions. We'll try and get some answers uh, or just offer comment. Uh, and, and when you're done, we'll take it back and we'll work with the, uh, with the applicant again. If, if at some point we're comfortable with the fact that we've gotten all the information we need to, we will close the public hearing like you saw happen on the last one and we'll proceed to deliberate about the application. All right, that's how it works. So, welcome back applicant. Would you introduce yourself again and summarize where we are? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Once again, my name is Frank Leone. I'm an attorney in East Hartford with the law firm of Leone, Throw, Teller & Nagel. I'm appearing here tonight on behalf of the applicant Maple Street 24 LLC, which is the owner of the property located at the corner of uh, Maple Street and Middletown Avenue, commonly known as 24 Maple Street, and is also the owner of the two lots that are subject of, of the applications for the change of zone. Uh, the principal of Maple Street LLC, or the manager of Maple Street 24 LLC, is Joseph Sulo. The Occupant of the property is Restaurant Supply LLC, and Mr. Sulo is also the manager of that entity. The property, as everybody I think will recall, is currently being used as an 
uh, a distribution center for internet sales, but also does allow for pickup by public uh, for sales that have been, uh, purchases that have been done on the internet. And as you will recall, last time that we were here, the commission requested um, a, a rendering of what the site would look like, and we provided that, um, which is now on the, on the easel here. And, and again, just to refresh everybody's recollection, um, to change this application is to change 159 and 165 Middletown Avenue from residential to business park. And ultimately, if that application is granted, these two parcels will be merged with 24 Maple Street LLC, which will result in that parcel becoming 5.47 acres approximately, as opposed to the 4.3 acres that it is now. The reason that we are seeking this change and the purpose of it, there are several reasons for it. Number one, uh, we need to have access to the existing structure. I'd like to pass to the commission um, photographs that my client has given to me. Mr. Sulo took these photographs of the building at 24 Maple Street when he first bought it. And as you look at those photographs, there are photographs of the interior which show mold on the walls. The exterior show, show overgrowth of trees. Um, and in order to remove those, he actually had to get access to the building through these two properties at 159 and 165 Middletown Avenue. And in order to do that, he also added fill to those properties, which resulted in the cease and desist that everybody is well aware of. But my point being that without this zone change, without merging these parcels, over time the same thing's going to happen. You're going to have overgrowth against the side of this building because you won't be able to access it because the westerly boundary lines of 165 Middletown Avenue and, and uh, um, 159 Middletown Avenue are between 11 and 12 feet from that building. So there certainly is no room to really access it for any kind of maintenance. In addition, we would like to take advantage of the warehouse, which is on this, the south side of the building, um, that has no access for trucks. So by annexing these two parcels to the property, you allow us to add a loading dock for access by tr tractor trailers. It'd be a much better use of the site. Uh, in addition, we want to add a handicap ramp, uh, which will also serve as an additional loading access ramp for customers who show up with a pickup truck, for example. So it will provide twofold handicap access and also um, a smaller loading ramp. In addition, it will result in additional employee parking so that the site can be better organized from a traffic flow for the trucks that come onto the property for the distribution. Now the real benefit to the neighborhood as a result of this annexation will be what's shown in this rendering. And that is because of the additional parking and the addition of the impervious structure, we want to create uh, or need to create a retaining wall. And on the west side of the retaining wall, there will be row of arborvitae, so natural vegetation. And in front of it, there will be a retention basin that will help for stormwater um, uh, drainage, uh, which the site badly needs and will need in addition to these improvements. The net result will be a buffer for the remaining residential properties on Middletown Avenue. Now, I'd like to point out that in this rendering, you'll see that there is a, a truck on the left-hand side of the rendering. That truck does not belong to my client. That truck is owned by Mr. Pacheco, who owns the abutting piece of property. So that is not part of the parcels that are in question of tonight's application. Now, once the, the uh, properties are merged and the site is, is landscaped, as it is shown in this picture, there won't be any construction of anything on it. So the purpose of annexing these parcels is not to build anything. The perp other than parking, other than the retaining wall. The purpose is not to build any kind of retail outlet, any kind of restaurant. It cannot and will not be used for that once it's merged. Um, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'll hold this rendering up so that the people in the audience can see it. Sure. 
So as you can see, this is the retaining wall. It's probably 100 feet west of Middletown Avenue. Planting's on the other side of it. This is Mr. Pacheco's truck that I referenced. It doesn't belong to my client. This is where the retention basin will be. You won't even know that it's really a retention basin, as I understand it, but it will allow for the collection of stormwater drainage. And at, over time, of course, the Arbor Vitae, as I think is common knowledge, will continue to grow so that people across the street will see less and less of the building. Although I, I would submit that since my client acquired the property, the building is a lot more pleasant to look at than it was before he purchased it. Um, so hopefully that is, is helpful for everybody. I'm happy to answer the question. I didn't really hear it. No, 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 uh, no. Please don't uh, throw questions out. I'm sorry, I didn't really notice it going on. You finish your presentation, then we'll take questions Fine. and comments from that. Uh, I will make a, a reference, though. That is it. This map that we passed around. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there are at least um, a couple dozen copies of this floating around that the town engineer made copies of before coming and made an assumption that it might be enough, but if you have one, maybe you could pass it to neighbor and share it. It, it is a conceptual plan of what uh, the developer is proposing. Okay. Um, what evidence do we have if this were approved that those, that drainage basin will be built? We were happy. You haven't really said, and you haven't asked to have us approve, really. We're approving a zone change, and you would not hesitate. It'd be kind of a strange condition to, in a zone change. I'm not even sure we can. The lawyers could so ask me, but I don't think you can do that. Uh, and I'm wondering how we make sure that that it, uh, is done. That's number one. Number two, why do you have to have the area just behind where the trees are there, or the shrubs? Why can't you just half this, cut it in half, and have the area back toward the buildings where you need the room for the trucks and the ramps and all that stuff? and leave the front one because you could still have, I think, the drainage basin in a residential area. That's what I'm saying, split the uh, request. And that would help uh, maybe the people in Middletown have a bit but uh, with their complaint but about the situation there. Uh, and also, the trees along that were trimmed out. I was down there again today and uh, looking at the whole site and going up where the railroad tracks were, but uh, I, those trees are not going to protect anything, and then the complaints and the hearing about the lights in the building and so forth are bothersome to some of the nearest neighbors. Um, and I, you're not really addressing all of that, um, and so it concerns me. In other words, what I said at the last hearing was I like to see on his own change a reason for the zone change. That is, and see it in some description, some adequate description of what's going to happen. And also there's the concern, of course, about the restaurant, which we may or may not approve someday. But the point is that uh, if you come in with uh, a, a site plan someday, I'm not saying that you have to come in with a full-blown site plan with all engineering detail and all this stuff that you come in to a hearing for a site plan review, but something more than what you presented, and it concerns me. Those are some of my concerns. So thanks. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the applicant to continue uh, the presentation, though, George, in a general sense, because I think it would also probably clarify for the public. This is just a zone change request. The zoning regs do not require that the applicant make a full site plan approval at the same time, which is where the details of what's being, you know, considered or would be considered in the future, um, or that would be a specific request to do something in particular. Well, I know that. Mr. That's Chairman. not required. Just, I'm experienced in the past on this commission of seeing 
some kind of more information Fair. on why a zone change is needed. Right. And I don't think I've seen it presented in an adequate manner. And, that, and that's fine. It doesn't have to be full plan. But this is their you don't have to approve a full plan. That's right. not what I'm asking. But this this is their attempt to show you what is being proposed on the properties as you requested on those two particular parts of the parcel. But, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that we let the applicant continue and then you can ask oh, these yeah. more specific questions when we're done. I'll out and might help him on his presentation. So okay. Saying it so. All right. All right. Mr. Leone, if you care to finish your presentation. and Well, I... I have to ask your indulgence, Mr. Chairman, oh. because I'm, I'm more than happy to try to address Mr. Oichel's questions. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if I can to his satisfaction, but I also don't want to appear that I'm ignoring them. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, as far as the necessity or the commitment, if you will, for the retaining, retaining along the plantings, by adding the impervious structure here, it's, it's necessary. It's the right thing to do. Because by adding the impervious structure here, the stormwater has to drain somewhere. So we want to make sure that it drains properly. So I, I don't know what more we can show. I, I think that this does, in fact, show you, sir, what we were asked to present. This is what our intent is. And the building of the loading docks and the building of the employee parking, that additional impervious structure is going to necessitate that we address stormwater drainage. I think it's part and parcel of what we're doing here. I, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's inherent in the project. You notice my comments included the catch basin, what I just said. Well, I, I understand that, sir. But I don't, I, you know, if we said tonight the zone change, how do we know that basin will be built? Well, because it'll have to be built if we do our parking so we can accommodate the stormwater drainage. That's what I'm so saying. So you'll be and, presenting a plan later? So, so George, there, George, there will be a separate plan presented to us for site plan approval. And the, the kind of things that our town engineer goes through, Mr. Chairman, uh, is quite detailed on drainage, right? Yes. Yep. You know, that's all I'm saying. And, and I would also point out, sir, that Section 1.3 of your regulations suggests that uh, um, zoning districts should follow lot lines so that making half this lot residential and half business park would be in contravention of your own regulations. Now this commission, in reviewing this application, acts in a legislative capacity. And that's, that's what your role is when you enact or amend zoning regulations. Because you're acting in a legislative capacity, you have broad discretion uh, to, because you're formulating public policy. So in considering this application, you should and need to consider the factors that are set forth in your own regulations. Specifically, section 1.2, which sets forth the purposes of your regulations, and section 10.1G.8, which outlines the basis upon which a zone change can be granted. So if we look at section G.8, Subparagraphs A and B speak that the proposed change is in accordance with the plan of conservation and development and that the proposed change is in conformance with the purposes of the regulations. So if we look at the purposes of the regulations, which are set forth in section 1.2, there are several listed there. The first is to promote and protect the public health, safety, comfort, general welfare of the community and living and working conditions. I would respectfully submit that the, these proposed site improvements do exactly that, especially because they're being annexed to an already existing business park zone as an accessory to that. And once it's merged, it's going to make this site better. And as we all know, when you drive across the, the Glastonbury Bridge, and you're entering Wethersfield, and you're approaching the Silestine Highway, this corner is kind of a gateway, one of the gateways to your community. And I would respectfully submit that before my client acquired it, it didn't look as good as it does now. Uh, and I would also point out to the property that Mr. Sulo de uh, developed uh, just west of here on the Silestine Highway where Family Dollar Store is uh, in O'Reilly Auto Parts. That's another site that he improved, and I only bring that up to show the pride that the gentleman takes in his properties. Second purpose, prevent overcrowding of land and avoiding undue concentration of population. Well, again, I think that these plans establish that 
that's not going to be a problem because this is going to be virtually open space. It's going to provide a buffer for the neighborhood. Conserve the value, conserving the value of buildings and encouraging the most appropriate use of land throughout the town. Again, because this improves the entire site, which as I said is a gateway, in, one of the gateways into your community, I think that that criteria is met. I think that the next couple are probably not affected one way or another. Regulating and restricting the location of trades and industries and location of buildings designed for specified uses. Regulating and limiting the height, bulk, and area of buildings hereafter erected. Regulating and determining the area of yards, courts, and other open space for buildings hereafter uh, erected. I, I don't think that the purpose of tonight's application affects any of those. Lessening congestion in the streets. Last time we were here, the citizens that appeared in opposition mentioned traffic. And I'm not about to stand here and say that traffic is not a problem in that area. It certainly is a problem in that area. But I don't think that what we plan to do here is going to have an effect on that one way or another. It's not going to lessen traffic. I'm not going to stand here and say it's going to reduce traffic. But it's also not going to increase traffic. There's not going to be an additional curb cut. And the use that's there is the use that's there. And, and, and again, to address, and this may be an appropriate time to do it at this point in my presentation, Mr. Oikin, when you inquired about talk of a restaurant, other uses, without the zone change, those other uses are available on the business park aspect of 24 Maple Street. There's enough room there for those uses. We don't intend to put any use on the two parcels that are the subject of tonight's application. Securing safety from fire, panic, flood, and other damages. I'm, I'm not sure that that's going to be affected other than we are going to improve drainage, if that could fit into that category. Providing adequate light and air. I think that the way we're going to leave the site is going to do that. Uh, facilitating adequate provision of transportation, water, gas, electric light, power lines, sewage, drainage, schools, parks, and other public improvements. Again, drainage will be improved. Minimizing and where possible, preventing loss of life, injury, and damage to public and private property caused by flooding and attended hazards. Not sure that applies to this application, but again, drainage will be improved. Um, the last one is a catch-all addressing other matter, matters authorized by the statute. Uh, so, so I think that we are satisfying the first two criteria of subparagraph 8 of section G. The next one, subsection C. The location of an activity is permitted within the new zone will not adversely affect the public health, safety, welfare, and property value. Well, I, I think that the residents have made it very clear that they are concerned, and probably legitimately so, as to how this zone change may affect their property values. The assumption is it's going to negatively affect those property values. Now, I can make an argument that based on logic, I don't think that's the case. And the reason I don't think it's the case is because I think by adding this buffer, which is what we're, we're adding, that we're probably going to improve the neighborhood and therefore probably improve property values. In addition, I would say other than Mr. Pacheco's property, the, the other property that's affected already abuts a business park. So that's already a factor that affects that property owner's value. But I'm not a real estate appraiser. So I have engaged the services of John Lamonte, a licensed real estate appraiser, and I've asked him to do a real estate market study to determine, in his opinion, as to how the proposed zone change would or would not affect property values for the residents on Middletown Avenue. So I'd like to turn the podium over to Mr. Lamonte. And by the way, I forwarded a copy of his uh, market study to Mr. Gillespie, and I believe it's been circulated to the members of the commission. But Mr. Lamonte will, will highlight that, and of course, if any of you have any questions of Mr. Lamonte, he'd be more than happy to address them. Mr. Lamonte? Good evening. Uh, my name is John Lamonte. I do business as John Lamonte, real estate appraisers and consultants. Uh, I've been a resident of uh, Weathersfield in the past for 21 years. And uh, I know the town very well, obviously, and I know some of the members in the committee here. But um, the market study that uh, Tony Leone was referring to uh, was in relation to the zone change. And uh, uh, going back to what uh, Tony Leone was pointing it out, 
you guys know this location probably better than anybody else, but I, I use Middletown Avenue a lot, almost every day, because I don't like to go on Saturday night way. Uh, it's, it's always traffic and it's always uh, chaos. <coughs> So I like to cut off on Middletown Avenue when I come from the highway or go into the highway. And uh, also I have some friends that live there. But anyway, so before Mr. Sulo bought this property, the, the, there was like a jungle over there. And uh, it, it was a mess. It's much cleaner and uh, as far as value, it's not gonna affect anything. Uh, number one, you know, the, those two properties, the 159 and 165 Middletown Avenue, they, they already are building, you know, uh, a, B, a BP zone, so it's a fact already there. This is nothing new, nothing that is going to be created or was created by Mr. Sulo, you know, uh, buying 24 Maple Street. Uh, if anything, you know, after it's done, it's going to be much cleaner. It's going to be uh, more compatible, you know, with that uh, corner, which is... Uh, uh, one of the gateways of uh, Weathersfield, like uh, Tony Leone pointed out, and it looks much, much nicer now, much more appealing. And so from a standpoint of value, if anything, it, it has improved. Now, going back, uh, and uh, I understand the neighbors are concerned, you know, I, I've done a number of these things, you know, throughout the state of Connecticut. And I've done uh, Dunkin' Donuts, you know, next to residential, uh, we've done ma many other things, and people always are concerned about value, but it, it is more than anything else, it's a perception. It, it's nothing to prove that value is going to go up. Value is not going to go down. Value is going to go up uh, in, in time, you know, and uh, assuming they maintain the properties, you know, in, uh, in a decent condition, uh, value is not going to de decline. Now, in this particular area, that what I did was, and, and the market study that you have, uh, number one, I look at Middletown Avenue for sales, and I, I use a time frame of two years, from January 2016 to end of December 2018. Uh, that's not an opinion, that's a fact. That's what the market is doing. So the, the market is going up. Now, that's based on the fact that 24 Maple Street is there. The building is there. That's an 83,000 square feet building. That's a large building. And the south portion of the building extends all the way down to 159, 165, and portion of 171 Middletown Avenue. So the, if an informed buyer goes to Middletown Avenue, assuming that they don't know is a zoning uh, uh, you know, application uh, uh, change, they're going to act in the same way. In other words, if they want to buy Middletown Avenue, assuming they don't know there is an application pending, they're going to go on Middletown Avenue. If it's a pending application, they're going to do the same thing. It's nothing to prevent a buyer to go on Middletown Avenue and buy a house anywhere on the street. So from 2016 to 2018, values went up on Middletown Avenue, and it's in my report there. Then what I did was I, I took a radius of about one mile and three quarter from the corner of Maple Street, which is Route 3, and Middletown Avenue, and I did the same thing. So I look for sales of uh, single family homes of, of any style, and also I look for sales of condominium uh, between two, three, and four bedrooms. And that's not an opinion of mine. It's a, I put down the number of sales, the average sale price, and again, the market is going up. So whatever Mr. Sewell is proposing uh, is making th this particular area, you know, much cleaner, much more appealing. And as far, you know, declining values, market values in, in, in a Middletown Avenue, uh, categorically, I, I disagree with that. It, it's not, nothing to prove that that's going to be the case. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, the, the market is, is doing what it's doing. And, you know, I put everything in black and white on the, on the study there. And, and again, the main, the main point here is that uh, th this is a large property. It sits on 4.34 acres, 24 Maple Street. And it's 33,000 square feet building, and it's there. 
this wasn't created you know, yesterday. This building was built in 1959. So it's been there uh, a very long time and the market has been reacting uh, based on what is there. So regardless of the fact that these two uh, parcels are gonna be annexed to 24 Maple Street, it's the same market. Uh, the, the difference is that uh, it is much more appealing now than ever was before. And I know the area well because I, I use it a lot. The other consideration is you have a railroad track you know, right behind that, that runs parallel to Middletown Avenue and we have a power, uh, high power lines you know, running along, along the railroad. So the area, it is what it is. It, it's, like I said before, if a buyer gonna buy any, any place in Weather Street or any place in the state of Connecticut, it's gonna make an informed decision whether they wanna be. So if you guys wanna uh, grant uh, the zone change, <laughs> if they wanna be on Middletown Avenue, nothing prevents them to be on Middletown Avenue. And so uh, as far as the market is concerned, I, I don't find any evidence that giving a zone change is gonna decline you know, as far as values are concerned. Mr. Lamonti, uh, as I look through your 60 to 80 page document, you have a pretty good letter of introduction, you have a variety of photographs, you, uh, you've gone through the whole neighborhood, you have the local maps, you've given us the economic demographics of the area, uh, neighborhood analysis, zoning, the market influence, conditions, copy of the assessor's record card, yes. photographs, real estate trends and indicators, uh, prepared by you, and I cross-referenced some of the records of C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, and, and uh, William Ravis. It yes. seems like you're pretty much on target with some of your analysis here. Yes. Did you um, did you inspect the property at all when before this was purchased and the condition of the property? No, no. I uh, like I said, I, I go by there uh, quite frequently, so, so I, I'm familiar with the property, but I didn't inspect the property. I, I was hired to do this last week. Based on what you've been exactly, doing. but I'm familiar with the, with the location. I'm familiar with the building because, like I said, I go by there every week. Did you um, consider looking at uh, renovation costs and a positive influence of this in relationship to other commercial properties in town? Meaning, if we have five out of 200 properties that are in dire straits, if not defined as blighted, because these photographs tell me it's a teardown not a renovation property. So it's quite risky, I think, but for any person to do that. Would you, if your assignment said that a renovation cost, an update to this property for the two plus million dollar purchase price in, in concert with a $440,000 purchase of the two homes, looking at the highest and best use for this site, which appraisal would do versus your market study, and then in concert with what the revenue might be with trucks being registered in Wethersfield and then the personal property that goes into the business. Well, that's if, the if that assignment was given to you that way, <coughs> would you be looking at this uh, versus a market analysis and on residential versus overall market analysis? Uh, no, if you, if you were hiring me to appraise this property from a standpoint of commercial or, or industrial, uh, that would be an appraisal which would be based on that. You know, the highest and best use that you mentioned will be predicated on the subject property. Uh, and uh, so it, it would be different from a market study. The, the market study is you know, in relation to, to the location and uh, the, the radius that I choose is about one and three quarter mile. Because you know, if you go behind that, then it doesn't matter. You know, uh, somebody that lives two miles, three miles away from this side, they, they didn't even know they exist. And uh, so uh, that's just uh, an indication of what uh, the market is doing in relation you know, to that radius that, that we choose and the time frame, which was 2016 to 2018, uh, for any style of uh, single family homes. So and it's exclusively for the influence factors of a one family residential property? In yeah, ju just to measure the market, you know, uh, uh, what is doing in terms of uh, number of sales and average sale price. So the indication is that prices have gone up. 
Now, uh, some areas, obviously, they go higher than, than other areas, but in general, the market is, is being Im improved. Now, uh, my point is that uh, uh, what was there before uh, was a high soil, you know, of a sort, because it was overgrown vegetation against the building. Uh, the area was a mess. Uh, and uh, so whatever was there was already there for the last uh, 59 years or 58 years, whatever. And this is a large facility, so there's no way that it's not visible. Uh, if, you, if you live on Middletown Avenue or surrounding area, you're going to know the building is there because it's, it's, a, it's a large facility. So the fact that these two uh, lots are going to be annexed if, if you guys approve it, if anything, it's going to make it, the area, you know, much cleaner and more appealing, you know, from where, from where you see from the rendering. And so as far as value is concerned, it's not going to be no impact, you know, in my, in my opinion. For the immediate residential uh, For the immediate residential, and, and even extended. If you, look, if you go further south on Middletown Avenue and you look on uh, Mill Street, uh, the, 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 that's one of the most congested uh, section of uh, Wethersfield. And so th th this particular building has been sitting there for the last uh, 50, 55 years, 58 years. And so as far as traffic, is not going to be any change in traffic. It's not going to be any increase in traffic. It's not going to make the neighbor, you know, worse uh, or, or better. You know, the, the, the neighbor is still the same neighbor, but that particular corner in my opinion, it's going to be a lot more appealing, which from a standpoint of value m makes an impact. So if the houses down the street are now valued prior to the renovation and purchase at, let's say, 180000 $190,000 on an average, uh, might these properties be worth two twenty, two thirty? dollars after this? I cannot tell you that because, you know, there's no way I, to I tell. But, but, but what I can tell you is it's not, it's not going to decrease in value. You know, if they were at 180 uh, today, they're going to be worth 180 one week from today or two weeks from today, assuming those houses are maintained, so you know. Positive. More, there's no uh, negative there. No. Not in my opinion. And I, I, I just did one, you know, not too long ago in Saventon. This was a, an apartment building in 55 units for 55 and older. The, the neighbors, the same thing. They were jumping up and down. And these were homes in the 300,000 range plus. Is no, is no proof that the value is going to go down if they're going to build a, an apartment building uh, 55 and, and older, you know, age restricted. It's the same thing here, you know. I, perception is worse than reality. Uh, people convince themselves that the value is going to, the value is not going to go down. If you maintain your property, the value is going to be there. The fact that you're going to annex these two lots to, to that building, which is there, it exists, is going to make it much cleaner, much more appealing. And so as far as value is concerned, no impact whatsoever. Okay, we have one other question that relates to the Master Plan of Conservation and Development. We went through 20, 30 sessions when we updated that process 10 years ago. And it relates to, a, my question is with a comprehensive plan and a conservation plan of development. Looking at the site plan, if I was an investor, I would think without this approval, we have about 30 to 40 percent utility of that building. With this approval, it would almost give it 80 to 90 percent utility, adding more value to the property. And I know that's not your assignment, but if, if the assignment was given to you for that, would that be a positive to the structure um, of that property and would it add value to the real estate with the enhanced utility that gives access to that tax third of the property? It, it definitely, yes. Thank you. Uh, that goes to the highest and best use that you were mentioning sure. before. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Other questions of the appraiser at this time? These don't have page numbers on them, so it's kind of hard. You, you did the list of single family sales along Middletown Avenue? Yes. 2016, it was three sales for an average of 206. 2017, it was two sales for an average of 207. In 2018, it was one sale for 172. Yes. I thought you said values had gone up. Uh, uh, that's only Middletown Avenue. Uh, I took a one and three quarter mile radius. And yeah. if you look further, you got more, uh, more data relating to the sales. 
And uh, you, you're going to see in, in one case uh, the value jump of almost 18%. Yeah, I mean, and the, the other one I'm looking at is you did 2017 and 2018 for the whole town. No, 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 no. It's a one and quarter mile radius from, uh, from the corner of Maple to, to, to uh, Middletown Avenue. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking at. Right. N not the whole town. It's one and three quarter mile radius. No. The second thing is where you looked at the whole town in 2017 and 2018. And... I'm not looking at the whole town. I'm looking at one and three quarter mile radius from the corner of uh, Route 3 and Middletown Avenue. There were 358 sales within one mile. Oh, yeah, th those are the whole town, yes. Right, that's, that's yeah. what it says, and that's, yeah. So, I mean, just looking at those, the average sale price only went up for four-bedroom sales, not for one, two, or three. So I'd, Okay, but what are that proofs? Well, you said the property values had gone uh, the, up. It, the property values in general, they, they've gone up throughout Wethersfield, throughout the region, throughout Newington, Rocky Hill, Cromwell, they've gone up. In, in the last two years, prices have, have increased, values have appreciated. Some sections, some neighbors more than others, but as a general rule, values have been, have been increasing. But this is not what my market study is. Yeah, I'm not... I'm not trying to convince you that the values are up, you know, for uh, Wethersfield uh, uh, as a general. What are we talking about here is that uh, this particular building, this corner, existed since 1955 when this building was built. So it's an every 3,000 square feet building. See, this property on 4.34 acres defines the whole, the whole neighborhood. This is the defining property, right here. You can avoid it. So if you are an informed buyer and you're going to go on Middletown Avenue, either I told you is a zone change application pending or not, you, you're going to know what is a Middletown Avenue. You're going to know that it is this building. You're going to know this is BP and it sits on 4.34 acres. And you're going to know that's the most congested corner of all Wethersfield. If you look at my photos, I went back, I did a one in the morning and it's only two cars. And I went back at four o'clock in the afternoon. And you take your life in your hands if you go over there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. So, that, see, that section of Maple Avenue, Middletown, that's an, to, in my opinion, it's an extension ramp of uh, 91. That's what it is, because I use it. So. Yeah. And, and so the point is, those conditions, they, they've been there. Either it's a zone pending application or not, they've been there all along. So if you are an informed buyer and you're going to buy Middletown Avenue or surrounding areas, you know exactly what, what you're going to because you've seen it, it's there. And so the fact that uh, they're proposing to annex these two small lots to that property, it's a benefit because it cleaned up the whole corner. The, the place was a mess there. If they're going to build this wall with the vegetation and you're going to have, a, you know, the, the drainage, it's going to be an improvement, 100% of what was there. So as far as values are concerned, uh, as a professional, I can tell you values are going to be impacted positively and not negatively. Yes. Yeah, just um, one quick summary. You've gone through a lot of details, but to focus in on now, the subject of tonight's hearing, which is the zone change yes. for these two specific parcels. Yes. In my uh, quick review of, of, of the document that uh, you prepared and was presented to the commission, your overall conclusion to the best of your professional capacity, training, and experience is that the change of zone uh, from residential to commercial for these two parcels has no significant impact, either positive or negative, but if there is any change, but any change that would be uh, uh, affected or, or caused uh, would be uh, on the positive side of things. Is that, is that a correct uh, you, summarization you, of, yes. of your overall conclusion? You are correct, 100%. That's my conclusion. Jim. Mr. Lamonte, 
How long have you been in the appraisal business? Well, About? I've been I've been in the business 43 years. Okay. But I've been in appraisal since the the feds required licensing in 1989-1990. So I've been in appraisal since uh, 90 uh, and uh, I've been in business since 1976. Got it. How many appraisals have you done commercial? Over a thousand? Just guess. Oh. Over a thousand? More, more than that. Okay. So you have some experience doing this. All right. So I was just looking at the uh, 1.7 mile radius. Yep. Uh, chart that you showed us. 2016, 2017, 2018. And I see the change from 16 to 17. 2.5 percent increase in, in pricing yes. on the sales you had. Uh, that's average, average. Average. Yes. And then in 18, 2018, there were less sales, but the average increase was 17.9 percent. Yes. So during this this period of time, and this is just within a 1.7 mile radius. Yes. Of this property. Yes. So during that time, this property at some point in time looked like this. At yes. some point in time. Yes. So it looks very different today. Much the the one, been removed. If you go by, you've seen obviously an improvement. It's definitely cleaner. So as a property owner, you're better off. Your values are probably better near a good yes. business, a good industrial business, whatever the type of business, than a not so clean one or not. Absolutely. And, and by the way, when you mention industrial, that's a wide umbrella. This is a right. distribution. So, which is different than manufacturing, you know. Right. So, it, it's it's a distinction. So, the the fact that uh, they're going to have a, a retaining wall, you know, with the with the heavy greens over there, and it's going to be maintained, you know, clean, uh, to me is an improvement. If I was 171 Middletown Avenue, I'd be delighted, because before was was a mess, and and everybody knows that. I mean, it's not my opinion. It was what it was. And. I mean, so, all right, and you're very familiar with the neighborhood, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. You're quite welcome. It. I guess I'd, I just want to be clear or clear, clear up my, my misunderstanding. I was looking at the 1.7 mile radius down Middletown Avenue, which I think is where most of these people live, showing that it went from 206 down to 172. One other question I had was whether the two sales in 2017 were these properties or were they different? No, they were different uh, properties. Okay. See, the the one sale you cannot you cannot use that because obviously it doesn't give you a, anything, you know. Okay. Now that that's a reflection of uh, what, what what took place in the market. It's not my opinion or my conclusion. Right. This, this is what uh, the market it did. No, I mean, and, and what. Commissioner Hughes was talking about the 1.7 mile radius. That's Maple Street. It's from the corner of uh, Maple Street, which is Route 3, yeah. to mid uh, from Middletown yes. Avenue going forward. And so the the one mile, 1.3 mile radius is going toward you know Maple Street and surrounding areas because you know if we move east from there, then we are on the, on the highway. We are on Putnam Bridge. So it's nothing there to. To, to measure as far, you know, uh, so market. The, so the 1.7 miles on Maple Street of houses, I mean, the next single family residence is up past the office buildings on the Silas Dean. Y yeah, past okay. the Silas Dean Highway for the most part, yes. All right. And, and I wouldn't uh, think that this building would have any impact on values over there. It's not the building, it's the market as a general. I, 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 we just did an appraisal on, uh, on uh, Maple Street not too long ago. I forgot the number, but it's that uh, historic uh, home, you know, the red one, which is right behind the office building on the corner. And the, the, the value of the property, we appraised it two years before. The value is a little, a little bit higher, it's not less. And that's the worst section of uh, on Maple Street because it's right on the curve, mm -hmm. you know, on the bend. And there's no way you can get out from the driveway uh, unless you, you take your life in your hands. And so, you know, values are what they are. I, I mean, what are they proposing here is going to be an improvement by any stretch of imagination. I guess I was just confused how you could do a 1.7 mile radius from a point in two different directions and have 
completely different. Whatever homes they, they, they were uh, transferred, we, we pick it up, you know, because okay. that's, that's in the multiple listing service. It's not my opinion. Those are the sales, and th those are the averages. I, I just want to show that as, as a point, you know, that the perception of the market is different than reality. The, the reality is what you see there. So my humble opinion, if you grant a zone change, it's going to be positive for the neighbor, not negative. Thank you. I was, I was just going to ask, um, what kinds of things decrease, besides market value and economy, economics, demand, school systems, what kinds of things de would decrease a home value in a neighborhood? A lot of things. But one, of course, the economy always yes. going to affect the market, right? If the rates going to go up, you know, uh, you know, in a manner which uh, is not sustainable, you know, then, then market value is going to be impacted. It doesn't matter which neighbor you are. But, you know, to be specifically, if you are, let's say, on Middletown Avenue, okay, if your neighbor or two houses down from you or, or right in back of you, you know, they, they keep the properties in shambles, you know, your value is going to be affected as much as you don't like it, even if you keep your property, you know, up and clean and, and nice and, and the whole thing. So, you know, there are a lot of factors which are going to affect value. But, you know, the main component, you know, in, in a neighbor are, you know, how the properties are kept, you know, the, the style of the homes, you know, the, uh, these entry home style, you know, where it's first time buyers or, or they okay. have some, something that people can retire to, you know, they don't need a lot of space, they don't have any kids, so the first time buyers. Transportation, employment, you know, shopping. And uh, who is next to you, you know, makes a big difference. Now, that's, see, my point is, I'm glad you asked me. My point is, I I if you are next to this facility, e either these two homes are still here or not, okay? Th that building is there. That building has been there for a very long time. And this is over 4.3 4 acres of land. So th this is a factor in, in this area. <coughs> it's a constant. It's been there for a very long time. So the fact that uh, if they ask for a zone change to annex these two, th see the building extends so far south that, that these two properties, they, they back into this property BP already anyway. So uh, you are not creating an, anything you know, new. Mm -hmm. It's already here. It's just changing the, the category from C to BP. But the logistics are, exist, they, they are there. The big difference is, is, is cleaning it up, which to me is a big plus as far as values are concerned. <coughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> One last question. In a project such as this, in your, over your time and experience, it's not uncommon to see a property, someone buy a piece of property of this magnitude and maybe acquire some abutting property for a purpose like this just to give them a little more buffer. Uh, actually, uh, no, I'm glad you asked. Actually, it's very common uh, because, you know, not only you protect your, your property in, in a way, but, you know, you, you can create a buffer, <coughs> if you will, which will, uh, you know, will uh, improve, you know, the, the, whole, the whole corner. In this case, th this is a large property again. And so this corner it, today looks a lot better than what it was, you know, before this gentleman, you know, bought it. And adding this property will enhance the appraisal value. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So he gets to pay more taxes. That, that too, yes. That too, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, You're sir. welcome. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Lamonte. And then the final criteria under paragraph eight of subsection G, is that the, the property is suitable for the intended use. Well, as I think I said at the last hearing, the configuration of this zone with 24 Maple Street wrapping around the two parcels that are subject of this zone change application certainly makes these two parcels suitable to be next emerged into this commercial piece. Couple that with the buffer that's gonna be created 
I think, brings it all together to benefit the town, the neighborhood, in general. And therefore, it's consistent with your comprehensive plan. Now, at the last hearing, the issue of spot zoning was raised. Um, and, I, and I think I'd be remiss if I didn't address it. In reading the case law, there appear to be two factors that determine whether or not of a, a zone change would constitute spot zoning. One is the reclassification of a small area. Two, the change must be out of harmony with a comprehensive plan. Well, I'm not going to stand here and say that these two parcels are not a small area. They certainly are, especially in conjunction with 24 Maple Street. So if you want to argue that the first factor of spot zoning is satisfied, I will concede that. But as far as the second is concerned, that the change may, must be out of harmony with the comprehensive plan, I don't think that is satisfied, especially when the parcels are going to be annexed into the bigger plan, into the bigger parcel, I should say. That makes the change in harmony with the comprehensive plan and the improvement of drainage, providing access for the maintenance of that building that's been in existence, as Mr. Lamonti said, since 1955, um, it allows the property to be maintained in a first-class manner, which is beneficial to the entire community and the entire town. Uh, where there's an extension, and there's a particular case, a GAIDA, G-A-I-D-A, versus Planning and Zoning Commission. It's a 2008 case, and it's in 108 Connecticut Appellate, at page 19. And it talks about an extension of a zone resulting from a zone change, which is really what this would be. This would be an extension of the BP zone into these two parcels. And the, the test then is whether that extension is an orderly development which reasonably serves public need in a reasonable way. Well, I, I would say without being repetitive that everything that has been discussed tonight confirms that, that the extension of the business park merging with these two properties into the larger parcel allows for the creation of a visually pleasing buffer and the ability of, to properly maintain the existing building. Now that's talking about the effect of granting this. Let's look at the negative side. If the commission deems it inappropriate to grant this change, what are we left with? We're left with two parcels, no housing on them, that are not part of this bigger parcel, no guarantee anybody's going to build houses on them in the future, no real clean buffer for the existing properties. I see nothing but negativity to the community if the zone application is denied. The annexation of these two parcels makes the entire corner more desirable, not only for Mr. Sulo's business, but also for the entire community and specifically the neighborhood on Middletown Avenue. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so um, I will point out that the, uh, the package that we got tonight had a, uh, first of all, <clears throat> it shared with us the petition so that everybody has a copy of the petition. It has, if you recall, our discussion last time <clears throat> is whether the petition satisfied certain threshold issues in terms of requiring the commission to uh, need six positive votes to, to move forward. And uh, Peter, I presume, was one who requested that opinion of, of counsel. And the answer is it was sufficient. Uh, and so this body must have six positive votes rather than the normal majority of five to, to move this forward. Um, and, I, and I will suggest that uh, the, legal, the legal opinion also included uh, comments similar to what the applicant just said, that there, are two, that there are two specific things that you need to be looking for and this, on the spot, spot zoning, that sort of stuff, all right? Uh, it's at the back of your package if you want to read it. All righty. There are other documents that came in for the record. There is uh, effectively another petition. And so I'll read one and then I'll read the names of those who um, turned, them in, turned it in, okay? 
It's a uh, petition that says oppose any change at 159 and 165 Middletown Avenue for the reasons, following reasons. One, the developer has not demonstrated any benefit to the neighborhood um, as a result of the zone change. And on the other hand, our neighborhood has demonstrated the negative impact of the zone change. Number two, the warehouse has functioned fine as it is for 65 years. Uh, and that uh, at sometimes at even a more intense level than it is currently. The third item, the specific reasons given by the developer for needing the zone change were created by the developer. And then the developer has not been forthcoming about the true intentions of the property. There has been an existing, number four, there has been an existing drainage issue in the rear yards of the neighborhood with runoff water from Silas Dean. And by clearing the land, filling and compacting the backyards for paving and demo, the developer has increased the drainage problem. Five, and I am, I am paraphrasing some of this, by the way, folks. Number five, commercial creep. Living near the uh, commercial creep does, in fact, lower property values. Number six, this will cause increased traffic on an already too busy Middletown Avenue and heavily trafficked Maple Street. This will cause safety issues pedestrians, for pedestrians, bicyclists, and pets, and we urge you to vote against any zone change. All right. So, yeah, Peter's got some and I have some, so I'm going to run through the names. Daniel Poulin from 345 Middletown. Carolyn Schwartz from 157 Spring Street. Amanda Rodriguez of 13 Lembo Drive. These are all Weathersfield. Christine Jackmo, is that right? Uh, 417 Middletown. Ann Fusco and Sharon LaPlante from 3234 Allison. And the last one I have is Carolyn Deco from 20 Casey Lane. And then there was another email from Pamela Brooks at 22 Casey Lane, strongly opposing the zone change based on the fact that there's so many restaurants and building vacancies already on the Silasine Highway. Uh, please decline this request and show support for the families who pay taxes. Are we ready? So that's what I have in the record. Peter, do you think I've missed any? Or you think I've got it covered? Ah. So just uh, th there was a real estate market study that we all heard a great deal about here. Uh, it is a large document. It is available for the public and in made part of the record. And a proposed <coughs> or... I shouldn't say it's proposed. It's a concept plan that um, was provided by the applicant in response to questions that came up last time about the intended use. And I believe this, and this is the copy that you folks have out there, at least a limited copy of them, and, and the rendering that has been presented on the board. Alrighty? All right. So questions for the applicant. I know if... Mr. Uh, Chairman, that concept site plan Yep. Because it's part of today's package, is it something that is just a reference point? Or is it something that the applicant uh, can see confidence in, in following up with George's observations? Is there any credibility to have a concept uh, site plan here? I mean, does it, is it relevant? So, so let's ask Peter to comment on the process going forward because I think I have an answer. But if the, I think the process going forward will kind of give you that answer, right? So I, as I spoke at the last hearing um, when the question was raised about the plan. Your regulations do not require uh, a site plan uh, to be submitted with uh, this particular zone change request. However, uh, at the last meeting, the applicant agreed to come back and share with you uh, in a graphic way uh, what they propose to do if the zone change is approved and they've provided that conceptual plan. There was a question asked earlier about whether we could condition the zone change on this plan. The answer to that is no. Uh, Connecticut does not allow what they call uh, contract or conditional uh, zone change. So uh, you cannot um, condition your approval on the fact that um, this plan has been provided to you. Uh, however, anything that happens on that property, if you approve the zone change, has to come back to this commission for review and approval. It may or may not be subject to a public hearing, depending upon what they're proposing to do. Additionally, it would have to go to the Historic District Commission, because the property is in the Historic District, and potentially it would have to go to the Wetlands Commission uh, for what they call an erosion and se sediment control plan. So anything that happens on this property going forward 
um, specifically as it relates to that plan there, has to come back to this commission. Uh, so the engineering issues that George was mentioning, uh, the drainage issues, the buffering, and the landscaping requirements would all be subject uh, to this commission's further review uh, if they want to want to do that plan. And as was testified uh, by the uh, applicant's uh, representatives tonight, they clearly want to do that or they wouldn't be here in front of you tonight asking for the zone change. So there is a, a, a demonstrated need by this applicant in terms of the utilization of this building that they've committed to you. So I would suspect uh, even though you may not condition, you can't condition uh, the zone change on this plan, uh, this plan, uh, if the zone change is approved, will come back to you uh, for your review and ultimate approval at some point uh, in the future. In a manner similar to the previous applicant, for those of you who are sitting here, the applicant was here with a much more detailed uh, plan of use of the property, and that's what this applicant will need to do is go through a site plan. And just to reiterate what was uh, talked about tonight in terms of the, there, there is a landscape buffer requirement that is in your regulations that mm -hmm. dictates that a certain amount of landscaping be provided along the uh, change between a commercial zone and a residential zone. So that's mandated by your regulations and will have to be complied with, uh, with a, a certain degree of specificity if they decide to come in uh, at a point in the future, so. Fair enough. George? Just one quick question. The uh, trees north of the two properties would not have to be taken down and or others put in, right? Because it doesn't relate specifically to these two properties with its own changes. The uh, existing line of evergreens along uh, Middletown Avenue? Or north to the corner, yeah. It, it depends on how it impacts, you know, the, the plan, um, you know, that they might come in with. I, I can't really answer that without knowing what their, what changes they would propose to the property. But it would be a future application in here. If they were to right. change they those? Before, and they can't do anything here now yep. tonight on a condition. You can't put a condition on his own change. That's correct. Yeah, you can't. You, you would have to come back and deal with whatever yeah. that issue is at another time, right? So, uh, along expanding that issue further, in I, I have a question for. Uh, the developer's attorney, uh, if I may uh, pose that, and that refers to y your listing of the various uh, advantages of, uh, of us adopting the zone change, this commission adopting the zone change, as it references, I think, uh, section 1.1 of uh, the regulations. As I recall, your statement relating to these, you know, these advantages uh, from a public policy standpoint really related to the, your, your conceptual plan of development. Can you <coughs> provide us uh, a description of the, uh, of the advantages, you know, pursuant to the Section 1.1 uh, 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 regulatory requirements uh, for simply the zone change itself for the property as is? Well, at the property as is will not be as is because those two parcels will be part of a bigger parcel if the zone change is approved. These two parcels are not going to stand independent from 24 Maple Street. So the benefit, again, is to... In all candor, it doesn't make any sense to me that this zone wraps around these lots anyway. So I think the benefit is much more orderly plan. And it allows this commission to have more impact on this corner, which has been recited many times tonight as a very congested corner. So I think there is a benefit to it, just in general, irrespective of the fact that we're representing what we're going to do with it. Uh, given that, would you say that, that then that you you would claim that the, the that the proper the probabilities relating to the future development or use of these two parcels uh, weighs in favor of the zone change? 
Could you rephrase that, rephrase that please, Mr. Dean? I'm not oh, sure I follow that question. Um, we have no, as, we, as has been indicated, we have no way of, of attaching uh, conditions to, you know, to approval or disapproval of the, of the zone change request. However, one can, I think, identify, you know, the, what are the, you know, the probabilities of what can happen as it relates to advantages and disadvantages. And those have public policy implications. And it seems to me that, 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 that much of your case hinges upon the, the probabilities of development in creating advantages, not just to this particular applicant, but to the community as a whole. And weighing the probabilities into your request, it seems like your argument uh, indicates, if you follow the argument, that, that it's more probable than not that the economic conditions and the, uh, the landscaping conditions, the uh, water flow conditions are going to be, would, would follow with improvements versus you know, if this zone change happens than if not. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. I agree with that wholeheartedly. You, you probably said it better than I did for the last hour and a half. <laughs> but that, that is a large part of your argument, I believe. A absolutely. And again, to be specific, if we want to put employee parking here, and we're adding impervious structure here, it's going to affect drainage. And this town is going to have something to say about how we handle that. And we're proposing that if we do that, we need to put a retention basin here. We need to have this green space here. So yes, it's more probable than not that the annexation of these parcels after the zone change to 24 Maple Street, more probably than not, will benefit the comprehensive plan, the community in general, and specifically that neighborhood. Thank you. David? David? Yeah, I have a quick question. This, you just mentioned there that we mentioned this is a preliminary plan. The park, number of parking spaces, is it based on, I guess, the best use to the pavement as you've shown it, or is it based on the use of the building or the future use of the building? I would defer to Mr. Heinz on that. I'm just, I'm just wondering, because, I mean, as you saw, the, preliminary, the previous person had a chart saying the square footage is for the parking, and... I was looking at this plan, it's a very nice preliminary plan. I was just wondering if it was based on any of mathematical equations or whether it's just best use of the property. Best use of the property. Okay. I think that's what you're doing, Mr. Hyatt, the best use of the property, and also to allow for the tractor trailer flow there, too, because it's kind of like we need X amount of space in here. We need room for the tractor trailer to move around and not cause a, a negative impact on pedestrians. Because you need to keep that center strip, if you will, at your loading dock wide open so the trailer can come in, get straightened up and come up. One can come out, one can go in, and they can be stacked. So that knocks out all that center parking area for us. Right. But in doing that, uh, it sounds like you've just indicated that an, an additional purpose for, for this would be or, or a, di a, a, a different uh, positive result of, of this change is that the that you know public overall public safety, particularly pedestrian traffic, will be uh, increased as opposed to be made more risky. The building that's in the back, I cannot operate my business without having them loading docks to load in and out of that back building. The way the building okay. was set up, it was more freezer space at one time years ago. They had a lot of refrigerated stuff. They weren't stacked and stuff that was on there. We have racks of, to do a distribution out there, and I need access with them loading docks. So I need trucks to come in and out of that space in the back. Because there's two separate warehouses. Mm -hmm. They're about approximately 40,000 square feet each warehouse. The other warehouse only have a 10 by 10 hole to go through to load it. We get two tractor trailers and we're, we're stacking up loads to go out. It's impossible to do it the way, you know, without having them loading docks over there. Okay. 
is your current operation, uh, does your current operation uh, uh, create risk or is, is you know, the safety of the area decreased as a result of your current operations? Mr. Dean, are you asking if the expansion of the impervious area to create more parking makes the traffic flow safer for the parcel? Uh, it kind of, uh, it result, that would be, the, that would tend to be the result, but I'm asking is he's got a current condition because I presume he's carrying on an existing business there. Does that current business create safety risks that would likely be cured uh, or, or, you know, the, the, the potential is in favor of, of a conclusion that would be cured or made, great, w made much more safe um, as a result of the zone change. So in, in that big building in the back where it's, it's all large appliances, in the middle of the warehouse is all small parcel packages. So all these big parcels, all the you know, large appliances are coming through the back warehouse and the middle of the building is all parcels. So we probably have, you know, 25, 30,000 items in the middle and we probably have 8,000 items in the, the, in the other side because it's bigger products. So what the, are the public safety risks inherent in, in doing that as it's well, now you know, operating? You guys are loading small parcel packages on carts and you got would have a guy driving a forklift through a 10 by 10 door. We just couldn't get the load. It wouldn't be functional building to use this for, for what we're doing. But I think, Mr. Dean, you're talking about the exterior, not the that's, interior. Is that's that right. Correct? I'm talking about the you're exterior. You're talking about the exterior. I'm so talking about the exterior traffic in, flow. In, in, if I because he was talking about, you know, uh, you know having uh, semi uh, trailer trucks come in and, and uh, you know, deposit uh, merchandise uh, as a result of what they would hope to be able to do uh, in, in altering the, the site uh, if they have these two parcels added onto the site as part of the commercial business operation space uh, of, uh, you know, of the entire parcel. It certainly is going to enhance the safety by, number one, it's going to allow us to have the loading docks that we can't have now because they'd be encroaching on the residential parcels. So we can't have those loading docks there. Therefore, we can't have tractor trailers accessing that portion of the property. So all the access would be over here, which does cause some congestion, obviously. So that is relieved with the annexation of these two parcels as part of 24 Maple Street. With the annexation of those two parcels or just 159? Would you have access to those two well, docks you with just 159 and not 165? We saw the turning radius issue with the trucks. You have employee parking that you want to move over there to free up this space as well. So could you, could you speak to how many employees you have working there and, and the we have a parking demands? And, and what time are they shipping and so moving? We're, we're there, the, the warehouse people are there, say, from 7.30 in the morning till 5. And then the office people, they stay till, you know, right now we're not staying late, but we may stay half a dozen people till 9, 10 o'clock at night to get them to the West Coast call. It's not and a, that's a call center. That's not a nighttime shipping operation. No, no, no. Okay. okay. And there's nothing going on Saturday. George? Yeah. Um, kind of going back to what I started with at the beginning, and this is probably directed more at Peter than anybody, but um, can the area be split? Can we actually split the zone change request and do something less, maybe, than they're asking for? I, you know what I mean. I'm saying split it in two and the front part be kept residential and you still build a, you know, a basin there, event, you know, that kind of thing, and you still would have enough room for the, from the wall that they propose up back to, for the circulation and turn around of the trucks. George, in response to that question, uh, if you, 
I don't know if you have them handy, but page pages seven and pages eight of your zoning regulations, specifically sections 1.3, which talks about zoning districts and how those are laid out. So section 1.3, uh, capital C, uh, reads as follows. Zone boundaries shall be construed as follows. And then there's a couple of, there's four different subsections. The uh, third subsection uh, reads, following lot lines such being lines of record at the time of adoption of these regulations or relevant amendments thereto so this provision and as i think we talked about this at the last hearing right. we when we change zone zoning well, districts they don't all do that all over town and have created problems for us where they do exist today so i, I can't well, speak well, what was the silas dean in the, the house which we just considered property lines to change runs right down the middle of the, the front of the lot. I what, mean, what house are you talking about, George, on Silestine? Well, the Silestine. The, yeah, a house. Oh, the, the Webb Dean Stevens Museum, is that? Okay. And, and the, the property line runs down and between the barn and the house. And created a, a, an issue that we had to deal with. So we do not advise that you do that because it creates these split zones, which the questions remain as to what you can and cannot do in the different zoning districts. So the rule as suggested in your regulations, I can't speak to how that line was created historically or, or others, uh, but they have created problems, uh, as you mentioned in that case, uh, Main Street Creamery, uh, we had a similar where that property is split in the back. So when those do happen, because they don't follow lot lines, it creates all sorts of questions that uh, tend to complicate uh, future proceedings. Uh, when you follow the prescription as detailed in your zoning regulations and you follow the lot lines, it's a lot cleaner, it's advisable, you don't create these situations where uh, at some point in the future uh, it leads to confusion and, and potential conflict. Um, so um, I would go with the ruling uh, as prescribed in your zoning regulations that they follow the lot lines. Yeah, I mean, and, and frankly, I don't, you know, I, I understand your question, but I don't think a detention basin is a permissible principal use of a residential property when it's Supporting. in support of, of, of a commercial yeah. property. So, mm -hmm. you agree um, with that, Peter? Is yes, I agree, that, I agree with that additional uh, clarification. Um, definitely, yep. And, and having considered that myself, George, I look at it just from an assessment point of view, the whole valuation of it, and then for the commercial property, you know, the taxation side of it, and then when you go to try to get a loan, you know, for the or refinance out of this building, you got this hodgepodge of pieces, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. what is this? You know? I'm looking at it as a protection, okay, zoning wise for the Middletown Avenue people. And that's why I'm asking. Well, to your point, and I, and I really appreciate what you're saying about what they're gonna do. If they wanna do anything this, to, to this, they have to come back to this. And as we know, landscape, lighting, parking, drainage, everything. If they want to do anything, then <coughs> step one is the zone change. And they, why would you even waste time and money on all those engineered prints and all this effort if we're not even gonna change the zone? I mean, that, that would be unrealistic and unfair to uh, any investor. No one, would, no one would invest in this town if we forced them to do that, because it's not feasible. No one's gonna throw their money out and on a wing of prayer, come in here and hope they get a zone change just throw your money out the window. Get the zone changed, then he has to come in. If we don't, we want to modify or don't like what his no, next I'm step just, is, then we. I'm just asking. Yeah, no, no, then we. I mean, and that's why I can see that. I, I can see that. Now, I think the protection might actually be less if you keep it residential because you wouldn't have to comply with the buffer requirements True. on that portion of it. Okay, good point. Very good point. And like you said, you could leave it as is. Yeah. You could put a picket fence in front of it, leave it the way yeah, it is. Exactly. He doesn't have to put that retention basin in at this point, but he probably will. So, I'm, if I owned it, I would, because I want to dry it out. That place is wet over there. I saw on this print, uh, you still have the handicap access ramp on there? Yes. Currently, if a, a tractor trailer driver, which may be surprising to some I have run into them, just people who are in wheelchairs that drive commercial rigs. Where does a commercial driver 
if he comes into your facility for a pickup and he's wheelchair bound, where does he enter currently? At this point, we don't have they don't, I don't, There's no access as far as I know. So he can't access the loading area. more common than one might think. Oops. So that'll be his access point there on that ramp? Correct. Could, could I ask the, uh, the, that's exactly where I was gonna go. I, you know, let's, uh, let's uh, this, we're all getting a little restless here. Let's get the public comment going, shall we? So, um, again, this is your opportunity. I'm just gonna take uh, raising your hands and, and join us at the microphone if there are more than one Come on, start getting up, um, heading over. Um, what was I gonna say? I, I would ask that you, if you have comments, questions in particular, you express them to us and, uh, you know. If it seems reasonable to answer the questions as we go along, we might try, but my guess is we'll take a, we'll take a list of the questions and then get the applicant up here uh, to try and respond to them all, okay? So let's try it that way. My name is Barbara Rue. I live at 79 Main Street. I'm not a zoning lawyer. I'm just sort of a citizen. And I would just remind this commission that when, if my dad were here, he'd say we're not the audience, we're the public. Um, what strikes me is that I, I think what's been done to 24 Maple Street is gorgeous. Um, but it strikes me that the gentleman bought the property and developed the property knowing there were problems and assuming that the town or the residents would be thrilled to pieces to have two, real, two residential properties bought, have the houses torn down, which is practically unheard of in the historic district. I mean, I can tell you of several instances where people had to rebuild, had built a house and there was like one original wall left or had to rebuild a garage because there was corner posts that survived. So it's really unusual. Um, so I feel very strongly that there really is no public benefit to, to what is being proposed. What has happened is the gentleman has sort of backed everybody into saying, gee, you know, it was a really ugly building. I bought these two residences, I tore them down, and now I can't really effectively operate my building unless you change the zone. And, and people don't like things being done in that manner. I think if the individual who bought the building had gone to the neighbors originally and talked to them, because that always helps, it might have helped. But I think the people on Middletown Avenue are concerned about commercial creep. And I think the people on Middletown Avenue feel like stepchildren to the historic district. Because in the historic district, the previous application on the Belden House, there were all kinds of bells and whistles that had to be taken care of. That didn't happen at this HDC application. And I just don't think he meets the, the, the requirements. And I think people on Middletown Avenue feel that strongly. Oh, it's gonna be prettier. It's gonna be greener. There's, gonna be, there's not gonna be less traffic. There's never gonna be less traffic at that intersection. The only time the traffic slowed down is when Kevin was in the middle of it. <laughs> I think this zoning change should be denied because I think that the, the, the applicant has created his own problem and he wants us to solve it. Evening, Marco Rodriguez, uh, 13 Limo Drive. I my wife voted no, I also vote no to this. Um, I just want a quick brief summary um, because there's been a lot of information uh, given out of what the goal is currently behind the investment in the property um, and the zoning change itself. It's my understanding that the goal is to have built this greenery um, and parking spaces and to help promote drainage. Is that the entire goal of this? Is that correct? Okay, yeah, very good. Um, so if that is correct, that's my understanding. Um, I would like to know how much money has been invested to do that. I'd like to hear that reiterated. Um, and uh, native Florida boy here coming up to Connecticut two years ago, so not used to the town, town stuff and how it works, but 
Is it the responsibility of the council, this is a question to the council, um, to represent the opinion, desires, and interests of the residents of Weathersfield? Is that correct? At some level, I would suggest. At some level? What, what would you describe that level as? I, I, I don't know how to characterize it, so I'll, so next, next question. Okay, very good. Um, uh, was that a yes or? At some level, okay. yes. Thank you. Um, at this point, is there any doubt that the residents of Weatherfield do not want this from the council? Is it clear that we do not want this? I don't know if you can answer that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to answer that. We have a petition to answer We're not going to answer that. Much of it is vacant. Uh -huh. The rest of the town, I have no idea. <laughs> the people who signed the petition don't know. Perfect. Um, well, they represent the town, don't they? Okay. Nope. They represent themselves. Okay. okay. Very good. Yeah. Let's let's move on, please. All right. Very good. Um, so, uh, well, let's see. Well, anyways, uh, I'd just ask you to consider that there are there are families that live in this area. My wife and two boys, James and Caleb love to go for walks in that area. Um, if due to the traffic traffic reasons that we do feel are going to be increased, more traffic, more danger to pedestrians walking and all those things, and something happens to a family or one of these children, just consider who's gonna be held responsible for these things. Um, this, this is a residential area, so just ask you to consider that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Crane, I live at 180 Middletown Avenue, directly across the street from the property 165, and I actually grew up in 165 Middletown Avenue, so haven't moved very far. Um, I currently own a property, uh, 180 Middletown Avenue, with seven acres of land. Um, it is uh, extended down behind the house and, and up the road a bit. Um, I am a long, uh, lifelong resident of Middletown Avenue, obviously, and I have seen, uh, in spite of everybody saying this property has gotten better, um, I actually grew up with that warehouse in my backyard, hardly ever even know it was there. Um, it used to be screened I, by what was described as a mess, um, used to be nicely screened from the road. You could drive up and down Middletown Avenue and except for the portion that was facing Maple Street, you couldn't see the warehouse behind those houses um, from those two properties. Um, I understand there's a need to maintain and do things like that, but um, basically that was providing a natural screening. I now sleep in the front bedroom of Middletown Avenue where the lights from that warehouse shine into my bedroom window all night long. Um, and there is literally no screening. All I can see is the mess from tearing down the two houses um, that they tore down and the warehouse. So I, I don't know how people think that's made it better, um, but having lived across the street for practically my whole life, I can tell you that it hasn't made it better. Um, those two properties were nice, nicely maintained residences in spite of some of what you've heard. Um, our family maintained one of those residences and some very good friends of ours maintained those residences before they were purchased. Um, there was, they were not dilapidated homes, they were normal residences in the neighborhood. And um, because of that, they provided screening to the warehouse. So in spite of the fact that it is a large warehouse and it was in the back lots of those two properties, um, except again for the corner lot where, where the Maple Avenue was, which used to be nicely screened by those trees before they took all the branches off, um, you couldn't tell that most of that warehouse was there uh, from Middletown Avenue. Middletown Avenue was a very residential appearing street um, with nicely maintained homes on both sides. I am incredibly concerned in spite of uh, what was provided to the contrary, and obviously we don't have access to all of those reports tonight, um, but m several of us have reached out to real estate agents to talk about property values. I'm very concerned about my property value. I don't think tomorrow I could put my house on the market and get anywhere near what I might have been able to get before this all occurred. Now, maybe at some point in time in the future, it's gonna get better, but I have no way of knowing that. Um, right now, it's a mess over there. And I understand that he would have to follow rules and all of those kinds of things, but I still don't see compelling evidence about why, again, um, 
why those properties should be converted into commercial zone um, when the rest of that of our street, Middletown Avenue, is residential zone, in spite of the fact that that warehouse is on a commercial zone, but the commercial property opens up onto Maple Avenue, not onto uh, Middletown Avenue, with the exception of that one um, um, uh, curb cut where they can drive in and out. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Yes. Are you saying there's a spotlight now shining in your house? There are lights all along the top edge of the warehouse and that shine into my house, and yes. If the applicant did come back with a lighting schedule that might be more complimentary, would you be back to I, testify in favor or against? I would have to see what that plan all looks like, but right now, um, you know, work. it doesn't. It's certainly not working now, not working no. Now. <laughs> That's for sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Larry Brown. I'm from uh, 188 Middletown Avenue. And again, thank you for your, your patience and the opportunity to address you. Um, first and foremost, I've got um, 34 more names um, for people whose homes are on Middletown Avenue in the vicinity side streets and such. Um, they asked that we present this, Mr. Harley, you had read mm -hmm. the letter itself. Sure. Can these be put into um, yes. the record? Yes. Do I need to, I, and I will if you ask me to, read all their names and all their addresses? No, no. Thank you, good. I didn't want to kill you people, so. Wait, okay. but don't ask me to stumble all That's over okay, them either. Hey, <laughs> um, okay, now, Mr. Sulo, it, we met um, the last year at the, uh, the uh, Historic District Committee meeting, and completely different, and we understand that. And, and I want to thank you for your honesty now that stuff is starting to be more uh, understood. We now know that this impervious structure is for the, the heavy trucks that have to back into these already framed out loading docks that you had put in there and then bricked up so people wouldn't really maybe notice them. But the cat's out of the bag. That's what he, he wants to do. That's one factor. And I think um, Mr. Mr. Leone, am I pronouncing your name? Leone? You, you kind of let the, the cat out of the bag when you said bigger plan. I think that was a slip, which is okay. No, you, you said bigger plan. I think you. No, you caught yourself and used so, a different word. The point I'm getting to, sir, us, yeah. I, I'm not Thanks. trying to be adversarial. Um, this drainage pool may be part of a bigger plan, not just for the existing business, but without this, and I still don't understand why we can't talk about the potential for a restaurant, but without this retaining pool, the potential restaurant cannot be there. Mr. Sulo has built restaurants. He has a bigger plan. He's a very successful man. And he's done very good, and I applaud him on that. But if we're looking down the road, and you can't guarantee, um, based upon the zoning laws that you have, things you can't do, all I can do is go step by step. That's the bigger plan they're going step by step. And that's what they're introducing. Your impervious wall, your retraining ditch, trees that get taken down by accident, but you can't put them back up. Things like that have happened. We've watched it over the past year, me and my dozens and dozens of neighbors. And this is what's continuing to unfold. All we're asking is honesty and support of our neighbors. Okay? So thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Brian Maliki, 222 Middletown Avenue. Um, I have a rather lengthy letter um, from a resident on Middletown Avenue, Judy and Ron Tacey at 212 Middletown Avenue. They're unable to attend tonight, so they asked me to read it. Um, it is long, so bear with me. <laughs> um, they state that they we opposed the zone change at 159 and 165 Middletown Avenue. We, submit a peti we submitted a petition at the December 18th zoning meeting signed by 115, uh, 115 residents who live in our neighborhood who are united in opposition. We are not attorneys, but we can read and hear is what we have researched, and this is verbatim. In Connecticut, case law suggests that there are two elements in determining whether a zoning map amendment is considered spot zoning. One, a change of zone affecting only a small area of land, which attorney Leon has already conceded to, 
um, a charge two, which is a charge which is, which is out of harmony with the comprehensive plan for the good of the community as a whole. The commission's actions must meet the two part test for zone change for a zone change. Where the proposal is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, it cannot be upheld. The 2013 Weathersfield Plan of Conservation and Development filed with the state of Connecticut states that it is intended to guide local actions and to provide a framework for consistent decisions over the next decade or so. Furthermore, the same document states, even though Weathersfield is predominantly developed, there are still issues to ensuring that growth and change, and change is managed in a positive way. On page 96, you will read the statement, protect the resident, uh, residential charter, maintain residential density structures in existing neighborhoods, enhance the character of residential neighborhoods. Page 94, continue, it says continue efforts to, ma uh, to minimize distractions or detractions rather. And most importantly on page 85, since Weathersfield is predominantly developed, the future land use plan looks much like the current land use map and the current zoning map. We submit that the future land use map, we submit that, uh, we submit the future land use map, which I have here and I could submit to the council, but I assume you're already familiar with all of that. Um, the zone change, the zone change proposal is inconsistent with our town's plan of conservation and development and future land use plan map as filed with the state of Connecticut. As we have stated previously, there is no benefit to our neighborhood by changing our residential zone. We would like to thank Commissioner Antoniak for asking about what the neighborhood would benefit from this zone change. I hope I didn't mispronounce that. Um, from the zone change. The question went unanswered by the developer because the answer is the neighborhood does not benefit, it only loses. In fact, this type of change will adversely affect us by lowering property values. We have received comments from two realtors that indeed stated that adding to existing traffic and adding the proposed bar will lower property values. Health and safety are also an issue when addressing the neighborhood when addressing, the, uh, when addressing the proposed bar. The reasons given by the developer for needing a zone change are contrived and, uh, and of his own creation. Our neighborhood has coexisted with this business property since it was built, which was, in fact, after the two homes. Perhaps our uh, predecessor smartly realized no house would fare well on that exact corner of Middletown Avenue, and that corner was given to our commercial zoning, but wisely the residential setback on Middletown Avenue remained. We would like to address some discussion um, that took place on December eight on the December eighteenth meeting. One, the 1955 brick factory building has been maintained since its inception. The apron that exists around that building has proved and is sufficient to maintain the property. No land extension is available on the south or west, and yet maintenance uh, survives. There was no real attempt to communicate with neighbors. There was, however, employees of Mr. Sulo taunting a neighbor about the demolitions. I'm not sure if they were actually your employees, so this may be misquoted. They were operating a uh, excavator. Um, if there is an increase in drainage, if there is increased in drainage issues, they were created by massive land clearing and an immense amount of fill and compacting done to the backyards, all of which was done without permits and through a cease and desist order sent by the town. An in-ground swimming pool was filled in before permission. The existence of the pool would indicate that the drainage problem was not initially out of hand. Adding more pavement would add more runoff. The prevalent pattern by the developer throughout this has been just to do it and then go ask for permission. Why does the town allow this type of behavior? Businesses come and go. We could be stuck with a situation worse by changing the zone. We all bought our homes thinking we knew what we were getting and we have lived with that. Changing the zone after 64 years is not in our neighborhood or in Weathersfield's best interest. Changing the zone is an encroachment by business into our established neighborhood. This would be a very dangerous precedent for our town. The door will be open for any business to expand by encroaching into established neighborhoods. A zone change is not necessary to address any drainage issues, contrived or real, and does not pose any issue according to Peter Gillespie. Um, Thank you, and we urge you, commissioners, to step up to the plate and protect the residential character, maintain residential de uh, density, and continue efforts to minimize uh, detractions as stated in the town plan. We are taxpayers who live here. Please do your job and vote no. Again, that was from Ron and Judy Tacey at 212 Middletown Avenue. Um, as for myself, I didn't really prepare anything to read, but did want to, and I have a copy, actually. I can pass that out. This was from 
Ron and Judy. Um, I wanted to just make a couple comments on what was said this evening. So I, uh, I understand that some of the uh, requests that's coming for this rezoning is due to the fact that um, the applicant can't get to his warehouse successfully and needs to be able to do maintenance and so forth. That should have nothing to do with the two properties that he purchased. If that was a problem to begin with, he should have never bought that building. I mean, that it shouldn't fall on us, the residents, to help him to succeed in his business. Um, secondly, uh, as with the, um, with the uh, conservation, the plan of conservation and development, um, it is a small parcel. We do think that this falls into spot zoning. I think we meet number the, the first um, requirement for it. The second requirement, I'll just go back to our 2013 plan of con uh, conservation and development. This is, I believe, partly what the council has to use in terms of determining whether um, a zoning change should be made. Um, one of the, the uh, pieces is to protect the residential character, is to maintain residential density structure in existing neighborhoods. We wouldn't be doing that if we rezone this to commercial. We're not protecting any residential density structures. Um, we also have a part of section six in the guide development. It states Weathersfield is primarily a residential community and residents want it to stay that way. Um, as part of the implementation schedules in maintaining community character and quality of life under the section protect residential character, um, the first priority is to protect residential character that's um, ongoing and it's uh, part of the Planning Zoning Commission to, to, to take care of that. Also, um, the second priority, maintain residential density structures in existing neighborhood that also falls into the Planning Zoning Committee. Um, this again was in the implementation schedules. By rezoning this to commercial um, properties, we're, we're not adhering to the plan. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jim Woodworth, uh, 33 Mill Street, 5H. Uh, I uh, drive up and down Middletown Avenue greatly and bicycle on it too. And uh, with uh, Mr. Eichel at the uh, bike pedestrian thing, boy, I sure hope that we can uh, do some improvements to Middletown Avenue to handle that, to make it look like a neighborhood street and not the bypass to the bypass that uh, the gentleman referred to. Um, I've also, because I drive by there, ride by there and so forth the last who knows how many years, um, when the vegetation was removed, and especially those two houses, but also the vegetation was removed, I was astounded at how big that building is. Holy mackerel. Uh, because it was covered by that mess or the vegetated barrier. And, uh, and what the, uh, the plants, all right, the one we have doesn't show that green area over there. And uh, the green, I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know if the, the plants can require uh, planting some, some uh, barrier on the neighboring property, because you only have that 10 feet or 12 feet on the, on the south side of the building. Um, but the, uh, whatever is that, that's uh, 171, I guess. Um, was there, but it was all covered up. You couldn't see it. And then, of course, going around to Mr. Uh, 179 uh, down there. Um, but maybe, maybe Mr. Mr. Eichel's suggestion about moving that back up, you'd lose about 20 parking spaces, as I see it on that, on this section here, if I counted properly, which may or may not be the case. But... Um, of course, we don't, are those required? Will they be required by the restaurant? And we've, you know, going through all those parking spaces, but we don't know on that. Um, as to the lighting, I think that's one of those, that's one of those irritant things that because I, I believe, as I, if I understand this correctly, the renovations were done without a site plan. And so the lighting wasn't considered and it seems to me that if you took that lighting and moved it out and, and aimed it back at the building, you wouldn't be lighting the whole neighborhood like it was, uh, you know, changing the character of the neighborhood just because the lighting is there. Uh, I can understand wanting to illuminate the building, but you're illuminating the whole neighborhood, and that's, that's like an irritant that you don't need to do. 
Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> but perhaps uh, Mr. Oichel's suggestion about, uh, you know, you, you, you got to go with the property lines. Well, all you have to do is change the property lines, make a separate lot, merge the two back parts of those lots into one lot, split off the other two lots, change the zoning on the back lot where you really need it for the for the trailer access. And I can certainly understand that. Um, but do you need those extra 20 parking spaces? And then you could have a, a greener, a better green green area. Of course, I'm in favor of uh, native plantings and. Um, pollinator meadow and stuff like that, but that's that's a whole different thing, and it would blend with the lot across the street to some extent uh, with the Great Meadows Conservation Trust uh, parcel. But anyway, um, in that regard, where do people park now if they wanted to walk in the meadows area? Well, uh, we had a walk on New Year's Day with a hundred people, and uh, some of the people did park in Mr. Sulo's parking area. Not as many as you might have expected, but. Uh, Last spring, I, I called him up to ask permission if we could park in his parking lot because there was a lot of construction going on, and, and he very kindly said we could uh, on a Sunday when there wasn't anything going on over there. But with or without our approval, you would probably continue that effort with Mr. Sula, wouldn't you? I would, of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Jim, did the trust take a position on, on? The trust has not taken a position, no. No, uh, no they didn't? No. Although we do have a board meeting next third well anyway, that's uh, yeah. beside the point. Um, but I sure would love to see a, a crosswalk just after that driveway with a sign in the center of it that kind of announces you are now passing from a highway bypass into a residential zone. Um, and uh, as I understand it, those things aren't that expensive, so it could happen along with all the other improvements that need to be made to make, that would help the, the people on the street. Uh, you know, you have, I mean, we're gonna get the figures maybe of how much traffic on Middletown Avenue. And, and I've heard, you know, like the uh, Borden building, the, the guy said, oh, it's not gonna make any tra difference in the traffic. Well, maybe not, because there's so damn much traffic already. What's another 100 cars? Uh, but uh, I think that's really important, anyway. Um, I don't know what to say on this zoning thing because I don't want to be the unfriendly to business Weathersfield people, but on the other hand, how do we re how do you reassure the neighbors that you're not going to that it's not creep, and uh, how do you make a buffer, and how do you make amends for the way the historic district handled things, sort of beyond their capacity, I guess is how you we put it, and the lighting. <laughs> I don't know what else. Anyway, thank you for all you guys do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Do I give my name? Yeah. Uh, David Kruk, 149 Broad Street. I live uh, down the street from uh, this proposal, this proposed uh, zoning change. And uh, I heard some of the arguments, and I was a little surprised at all the people against it, because I'm thinking, you know, it's, there's already commercial business there on both sides of the street. There's the uh, judicial offices, very busy street. It's not a residential-like intersection, you know. And I, and when I, when I heard uh, the, it's in the historic district, I was kind of shocked. I, I live in the historic dist district right on the green, and I thought the historic district ended at Maple Street where the bridge is because that's where you got the commercial businesses and, uh, uh, and uh, so anyway, so. So I found out that it goes a little bit farther, and this is a, a commercial business, and I guess it's been there for a while. It's not like he's asking to build a, a warehouse. The warehouse is there, and there's some land at that intersection, which would be definitely unsuitable for a house at that very corner because of, of uh, the traffic and terrible for kids to live there. But there are a couple houses a little bit down further. And I think the only reason why it's not, if, if there were no homes there in the first place, it would have been part of uh, more of a commercial zone for hit, for the business there. And and uh, uh, there's no homes there now. And, and as far as the historical district, these are not historical homes that were there. These, these are just more modern homes. And and I, I um, uh, as far as I know, there's no interruptions by the audience while, while I'm speaking. Okay, so anyway, so, 
as far as property values, I hear a lot of people talking about property values. And I, I've gone to, I've been living here 20 years, and I, I've gone to a lot of these meetings. And I hear everyone say, oh, my property value is going to drop, even when something was uh, changed in old Weathersfield. And it, it, there were all these fears that were, were, were not true. My property value actually increased uh, several years after I bought it, and it wasn't because anything changed in the neighborhood, because I bought it when property values were low. It was a buyer's market. And then a few late years later, it was a seller's market, and my, the value of my house increased dramatically. So it wasn't because of anything that changed in the neighborhood. But I do know one thing that uh, affects property values. It's the uh, blighted homes or the condition of homes in the neighborhood. Now, with, with, a, with a property owned by a business, they're going to take care of their, their property. Uh, some homeowners may not take care of their property too well. And, and they, they brought up another issue about drainage. They could be regulated as far as drainage or issues, uh, and property owners, uh, residential homes could not possibly do a, a drainage plan on their property. That's something that would be out of the question. And, uh, and I, just the last speaker mentioned uh, uh, how he used a parking lot for parking for the nature walkers on the weekend. I'm thinking, wow, that's a beautiful uh, benefit to having a bigger parking lot there. You have more space for people to park who otherwise have nowhere to park to go walking in nature on, on the weekend. I, I've never walked, I've, I've known him, I've never walked in, the, in, in nature, but uh, it, it would be nice. Um, as far as uh, the last speaker said, business friendly. Westfield has not been known to be business friendly. The problem is we don't have much business uh, uh, lots. We don't have, we don't have the, the lot size for a lot of businesses. And I remember when Channel 3 moved from Harford, they considered Weathersfield for a short while, but they moved to Rock Hill. You know why? We didn't have the, the space to put there uh, that they needed to, to open their, ch that they wanted, and Rocky Hill did. We have very little uh, commercial space left in, in Weathersfield. It's mostly homes. The balance is out of whack. The amount of uh, space for residential homes co uh, compared to commercial properties, that's why the, the tax, the residential owners are paying the brunt of the, the taxes because there's just not enough space for commercial property. And they just, and this owner wants just a little bit more space of property that they bought, knocked down the homes that were not historic homes, that's, that abuts that uh, commercial property. And, uh, and, and as far as the, the area suitable for adding that little space, this is right at the end of the Putnam Bridge. I don't consider it, I, th th that looks like commercial space to me. It, you know, there, there's some houses down in Middletown Avenue, but when I go there, go off the Putnam Bridge, what do you see? You see legislative offices on your right, you see the business on your left, it looks commercial. And I don't see how, the, it's not like he's gonna double the size of his warehouse, he just needs a little bit more space for, for some vehicles and parking. And I think it's a good idea, and I live right in that neighborhood. I don't fear property values going down, you know, and- Please. And, and I, I, I don't think, I think it, it, they're like, like, I remember when Weathersfield, uh, even on the green, was to make a change. One of the owners, I'm not gonna get into it, but there were a lot of the neighbors who lived in that surrounding area complaining about things that were just not justified. And, 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 and even, even on Main Street, there's always gonna be people complaining, but I, I usually don't join the band, bandwagon. I, I just speak what I feel. And I feel like this would not be a bad idea. I think it would be a good idea, because that is a commercial area right there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you get the clap. <laughs> <laughs> good evening. I'm Bruce Crane. I live at 180 Middletown Avenue, across the street from uh, the area in My family has lived here uh, on Middletown Avenue for 50 years, and I'm here tonight to speak, obviously, in opposition uh, to the proposed zone change. I've taken a few photographs and added reference to portions to, of the zoning regulations that I think are applicable, and I'm sure that many other parts of the regulations are applicable, but you folks are the experts, and I don't pretend to try to interpret them all. Uh, as I speak, I will refer to Mr. Sulo and Maple Street 24 LLC interchangeably. Uh, there have already been occasions when Mr. Sulo has violated our town's requirements 
His actions demonstrate a lack of concern regarding the town's regulations. For example, part of the land that is zoned residential has been filled and compacted. This work was done in violation of regulations and a stop work was ordered or stop work order was issued by the town. As a part of this work, mature trees were removed from the rear parts of the, of the uh, two house lots. Also, Mr. Sulo began demolition of the two houses at 159 and 165 without obtaining the necessary demolition permit. Subsequently, he obtained the necessary permit and demolished the houses. By the way, I was the person who was taunted by the people who were starting to demolish before uh, the <coughs> permit was issued. Um, I have brought a few photos. I'll pass them along afterwards. Um, but uh, referring to f four photos that I'll hold up in a second, can be seen that the demolition of the two houses and the removed uh, mature trees from the rear of the residential properties have exposed the east side of the warehouse to view from Middletown Avenue. This violates the zoning requirement that the proposed use or activity will not alter the essential characteristics of the area or adversely affect property value in the neighborhood. In my opinion, the character and property values of the neighborhood have already been negatively affected. I'll just hold up these four photos. On the top is before where the houses were still intact and you can't see the warehouse. And afterwards, after the houses were taken down, you can clearly see the whole warehouse. There was no screening because the trees and the houses were removed. Uh, there are nine lights. We talked about, other folks talked about the lights, mounted uh, near the roof line of the warehouse. They are no longer shielded or blocked because the trees and the houses were removed. They're very bright and they shine all night, illuminating the neighborhood and shining into windows of neighboring houses, including ours. Uh, I took a photo at night showing some of the, light, some of the lights. Uh, they're so bright that the camera couldn't take a picture of anything except for the lights. And it doesn't really show that they're bright here, but trust me. Uh, the characteristics of these lights violate the current zoning regulations that require that neighbors and night sky be protected from the nuisance glare and stray light from poorly shielded, aimed, placed, applied, or maintained light, maintained light sources, and that industrial and exterior lighting shall not produce glare on public highways or neighboring property. I realize that the lights can be changed or shaded to meet the requirements, but at this time they're in violation. I have three more photos here that show uh, the pine trees that parallel Middletown Avenue. These trees start at Maple Street and parallel the original parking area of the warehouse. Um, and their lower branches have been completely removed so that the screening effect of those trees is gone. And you can see where the trees have been denuded at the bottom for about 20 feet and you can clearly see all the way up to the warehouse no screening from Middletown Avenue exists anymore. Uh, now that the houses have been removed, the area currently zoned residential needs to be cleaned up and proper drainage done. This work, I maintain, can be done without a zone change. I'm sure you guys know that and it should not be used as an excuse for a zone change. As I previously said in my opinion, Mr. Sulo has demonstrated a disregard for our town's rules and regulations. I do not think that he should be given further opportunities to do as he pleases in our neighborhood. I recognize that we already have spot zoning 
for the existing warehouse property, I strongly oppose removing additional property that's designated residential zone and allowing additional business zone creep into the neighborhood. There has been much speculation as to additional commercial use that Mr. Sulo has in mind. They're talking about restaurants or whatever. I have no knowledge of that, and I will not address the subject since I have no firm knowledge of his intentions. Maple Street 24 LLC has already done irreparable harm to our neighborhood by removing houses and trees. Allowing the requested zone change would increase commercial zone area from about 4.3 acres to about 5.5 acres, opening up the possibility of additional commercial uses. If the requested zone change were to be approved, unforeseen uses could easily be implemented by Maple Street 24 LLC, and we neighbors would have no ability to oppose such changes. It is my hope that my remarks and those of others directed to the zoning board tonight were sufficient to cause the board to deny the zone change application. Again, please do not approve the requested zone change. I have one more photo. Uh, this photo was taken uh, from my front yard uh, and it shows our view of the warehouse from the front lawn of our house. I think that you would agree that this view detracts from the value of our property when compared to views that included the two well-kept houses. Uh, in an email from Peter Gillespie that received today, he reported that the developer has submitted a report from a consultant regarding the issues of neighborhood property values. I challenge the consultant to stand in front of our house at 180 Middletown Avenue and state that our property value has not already been affected. I realize a lot of what I've said here is not news to you guys, uh, but I wanted to emphasize my observations as a basis for future concerns and my strong request that the zone change be rejected. And I only have one more off the cuff thing. I agreed with speaker number one. Mr. Sula is a smart businessman. He knew what he was buying when he bought the warehouse. He assumed he was going to get whatever he needed so he could get access to the back. I think if he needs access, he's gonna have to rearrange the way he puts the big parts and the little parts in the warehouse or change some, make some changes internal to the warehouse. It should not be used as an excuse for his own change. Thank you. I, I do have one question. I, I do have one question Shoot. for you, sir. What, you, you mentioned earlier that you were taunted. Yes. And my question is, what did you do that made others taunt you? Um, there were two gentlemen who were uh, disassembling part of the garage. They had taken the garage door, the main door for, down for the prop apart. those property lots. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I took pictures. I sent pictures to the town hall. Um, and subsequently, they were told to put that back, put those back. Well, I happened to be in the front yard when the gentle, the two men were reassembling and they saw me and they knew I was the one who had uh, reported them. So they said something like, ah, ha, 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 the building's coming down, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Like school children kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Does I anybody just... have questions for me? I will. Yes, thank I'll you. pass thank also you. my uh, my speech. Thank you. I apologize for my ability to speak. But, you did a uh, nice job. Perfect. Well done. Um, yes, I'm Chris. Sir. I live in town on Garden Street. I initially came here just to listen. 
but having relatives that are affected by this and owning land in the town in a historic district, it affects me too in the fact that I'm afraid that this could set a precedence. This could be used as a case, a sample case for more zoning changes that maybe aren't friendly to residents. And I, I was always under the understanding that the reason uh, zoning laws are in place are for the residents, not the businesses. The businesses have to do the job of convincing. The residents are protected. Um, and so are the property values, which I believe, just from what I have seen, being on earth as long as all of us have been, that when a business comes in and uses trucks, you're going to have an increase of noise. No matter how many trees get cut down or replanted or fences put up, it doesn't take away the increased, we're talking semis coming in and more wear and tear on our roads that we're taxed for. Uh, pollution in the form of diesel fumes. Neighbors don't want to have that in their backyard. Light pollution, horns, yelling, open that door, to the slamming of, of bay doors, open, close. It, it, it's just the noise of business, which is great progress, but not if people don't want it next to them. I don't understand how that won't affect property value. Even uh, houses that are attacked for blight are for that reason. If you live next to something that's annoying, it's going to bring property values down. But I, I, some of the changes, like justifying why you would want to have where there were houses, a driveway, it makes me worry that there was a rumor in town about the restaurant, and I don't think the rumor was completely true, but what's to keep future owners from putting a restaurant in the main building and saying we have enough parking now? Because I know one thing in Weathersfield, if you want a business on Main Street, the first issue is where the car is going to park. If you can only have one car, but you're servicing more than one client at a time or, or customer, and you can't find a place for them to park, it, it's like an automatic out. No one's going to approve it most of the time. Things do change, and that's another thing I'm worried about. We're here now, but when we're gone, are people going to go on Middletown Avenue and say, <coughs> whoever approved this? Because people say that now about certain things. And as far as a lack of business property in a town, why does it take so long to fill properties on the South of Steen besides the high taxes? You know, there's plenty of other properties, plenty. That's, that's just... That's right up there with the excuse where you need 12 feet away from your property uh, line to clean mold. I, that, that's new to me, too. I mean, I keep my house clean, and I'm right next to the house next to me. But uh, the congestion is going to be more. The noise. People just don't want to be near that. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it being a majority resident town. You compensate other ways for the tax base, because that's what people wanted. That's how they got you here. It, it, so, I mean, I'm not good at public speaking. I just bring up bullet points most of the time, but uh, it's a slippery slope. And uh, it can lead to the destruction of more historic property, which we like to protect and are willing to pay higher than normal taxes for. That's why we put up with it. But uh, anything else is just kind of a repeat of some good points of some concerned, not afraid people that spoke before me. A lot of people say, Oh, you're driven by fear. No, people are driven by having foresight and being around long enough to see what happens when this is, you know, unchecked or allowed. And that's about it for me. I don't know if any questions. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bob Woodward. I've lived at 456 Middletown Avenue for 40 years now. And I have three primary reasons that I want to raise tonight to encourage you to find the wisdom and the courage to vote against this zoning change. One is that for 60 years, the two houses that came down and the building that is there have coexisted peacefully together they could still be doing so had Historic District not voted differently. Number two, someone mentioned commercial creep. 
There's one property in our neighborhood that I think within the next year or two will come on the market. Others might. There's one that is empty because the house became unlivable and the town required it come down. Do we have to fear that every time a property on Middletown Avenue comes up, especially away from the uh, wetlands, that somebody will be coming to you for a zoning change and because of precedent, you will have to grant it? The third thing is precedent. I ran into someone between the last meeting and this one, and they said 20 years ago, they came to this commission seeking to put a business into an already commercial place up in the old Kmart Plaza where Price Right is today. The neighborhood behind the railroad tracks there turned out in force to speak against it and the Planning and Zoning Commission said no. You have seen that our very long, narrow, and diverse neighborhood has come together to speak out and say no, please don't do this please take that into serious consideration and please vote no. Hello, my name is Christine Brown. I live on 188 Middletown Avenue and I oppose the zone change because the zone change is only going to benefit Mr. Sulo. I haven't heard one neighbor on our street that has said that they're good with it and that it gives them any kind of value. So please reject this application and protect our neighborhood. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine Jacomi, 417 Middletown Avenue. I wanna first make some comments about different things that were mentioned today. Um, and a couple of the things were already said, but I want to reiterate them. The realtor repeatedly said that 24 Maple Street was a mess before it was cleaned up, and he went on and on and on about how, um, how much better it is now. Um, yes, if you just look at the building, and it was brought up that um, it now is visible. I totally was t unaware of how huge that warehouse is, now I can see it in its entirety. There's nothing shielding it. The trees along the roadside have been trimmed. Those lights are horrendous. You drive by and it's just very, very evident. It's just in your face that yes, there's a big warehouse there. Whereas um, having been a lifelong resident on the street, I was barely aware of it being there. Um, it, it was never as exposed as it is today. Um, with regards to the second part of what the attorney said about spot zoning and uh, with regards to the harmony of the area, well, I think the harmony of the area was that it is a residential zone and changing it from residential zoning is not going along with the harmony of the area. Uh, these properties have been residential homes for at least 60 to 65 years. And um, then the comment that was made about um, also by the attorney that if these if the zoning is not uh, changed to commercial then these empty sites will not look very good well I think it was pretty presumptuous of the developer to go ahead and demolish the houses before he actually got the approval from this committee to have the zone change and so um, to repeat what someone else said it's it's not our fault that he went ahead and did that um, and um, I think a big point that I want to say is that once the zoning is changed, we're, we're being shown really nice, pretty pictures here, but um, that doesn't change the fact that once the zoning is changed, we're not really protected from what could occur in the future. Um, this business that he currently has can go out of business, and then this area has now been zoned no longer residential, but commercial and then um, someone else can do whatever they want with it. And um, with regards to the man that lives on the green, to say that you live in the area and you're not opposed to it, you don't live in the area. You don't live on Middletown Avenue, you live on the green. And the fact that you don't know that Middletown Avenue is a historical district, um, that's, that's, you know, that, that's your ignorance that you didn't know that. 
Um, and to say that, well, gee, there's leg legislative offices in 24 Maple Street, they're, they're commercial. They are not on Middletown Avenue. They are on Maple Street. Um, I had prepared something to read, and I am going to read that, but I do want to say that before I read it, I, I am basing this on information that I have read in the newspaper, um, and I hope it's accurate, um, but if it's not, I do apologize if an apology is warranted. Uh, what I had written and prepared for reading today is we are here tonight to discuss whether or not residential properties numbers 159 and 165 Middletown Avenue should be changed to commercial zoning. This is our second meeting to discuss this matter. When we met in December, many residents spoke and nearly all were in opposition to the zone change. At that December meeting, the zoning board made the ruling to postpone their decision until the January meeting as they concluded that not enough information had been provided on the actual intended use for that property. Thus, we are here again tonight. At the December meeting, I had assumed that the developer was not present as it was only his attorney who spoke at the meeting. However, I was wrong. He actually was present and therefore he could have perhaps saved us all time and additional weeks of stress over this matter by answering questions that night. As residents of Middletown Avenue, we like our street. Many of us have lived here for decades. It is a very popular street used by many joggers, walkers, bicyclists, both young and old. It is a residential neighborhood and we care about our street and our homes. We as residents and taxpayers of Weathersfield are voicing our concerns and opposition to this proposed zone change. The developer, Joseph Cirillo, is a businessman. Since that December meeting, I have learned that he has multiple illicit businesses in other surrounding towns, and God help Weathersfield and our neighborhood if he gets this zoning change and at some point in the future puts a strip club at our doorsteps, as he has done in about four other communities. This is complete trash, and I can honestly say that since learning of his involvement with such businesses, I have little respect or trust for a person such as this. Irregardless if this is what he has planned for this site or not at this time, once the zoning for these properties is changed from residential to commercial, it opens the door for the possibility of such horrible businesses in the future at this site. Normally, I would not have worried about this, trusting that the Historic District Commission would never allow that to happen. However, for reasons not understood by any of us, they gave him approval for the demolition of the two homes on those properties, which shows that they care very little for our street, which is part of the district that they are to be protecting. Unlike the Historic District Commission, we as taxpayers, homeowners, and residents of the area do care. We care about our neighborhood. We care about our town. We want what is best for our street, and changing the zoning would not lead to what is best for the area. Amongst other issues, it would lead to increased traffic, safety concerns, noise, perhaps crime, and a drastic change to the appearance of our neighborhood. So many of us have spoken up and have voiced our opposition. We are telling you that we firmly oppose this zone change. Please hear us. We want to protect our lifestyles, neighborhoods, homes, and town. Damage to the street has already occurred as the two homes on those properties have already been demolished by the developer. Please do not allow him the ability to further ruin our street by changing the zoning, which would allow him to bring further demise to the area. It is not too late to correct this situation from forever changing our neighborhood. Please protect Middletown Avenue, our residential neighborhood. Please keep these properties, numbers 159 and 165, zoned as residential properties. I urge you to please give serious thought and consideration before making your decision. So many people have expressed opposition to commercial zoning for those sites, and we strongly request that you deny the zone change. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tom Pacheco. I was here before. Um, I live at 171 Middletown Avenue. Um, I'm representing the house for my mother. My mother, Mary Boyle, owns the house. Um, basically, like I said, I've, I've grown up here all my life. And, uh, you know, long before Joe even knew about this place, um, I've seen many things come and go here um, throughout the years. Um, back in the days, back in the 60s, um, Associated Grocers, um, basically, back then they wanted all five properties adjoining, going south on Middletown Avenue. Um, they asked the, the residents, my parents, the Florences, um, Schubert's, uh, uh, what do you call it, Lasco and um, Gorman right now. Um, basically, um, everybody kind of shot it down before. That's, what, that's why Associated Grocers moved out of the 
the, the area because they needed more space to grow. Um, basically, um, like I said, I don't have a, a big thing about, you know, commercial, because like I said, if you look up the street, we're at the crossroads of Connecticut. There's a Silenstein Highway, and if you look at it, you got Glastonbury coming in from the from the east. You got Newington and from the west. You got Hartford from the, the north, and Rocky Hill from the south. Everything crosses right through that main intersection. Um, basically, when you look at Joe's property or whatever, um, I like I said, when I was a kid, that was just a country corner. Um, there was no big, there was no parking lots, there was no, you know, but um, that ship's kind of sailed. It, it's gone. Um, I rode back before he even bought the property. I rode a little thing because I, I drove up to that corner like maybe five, six years ago, and I sat there at the light, you know, coming in from Glastonbury, and I looked, and I was just astonished of all the things that I seen. Um, basically, that whole corner went commercial a long time ago. You know, you can't erase what's there today. Um, basically, um, I've seen um, base, um, all kinds of um, other things happen, but base, my basic main concern about this property, okay, and other properties um, throughout the neighborhood, and including the Solestine Highway, okay, and I, I keep coming back to the same results, is the water, okay? Um, if you look at all the buildings that are up on the Solestine Highway, and you go to their back parking lots, you'll see that all that water comes off the Solestine Highway, comes down through these properties. And I was, like, that last rainstorm we just had on that Friday, three, three inches or so of water, um, the foundations filled up with water. My yard, like I said, water comes around my house, goes into his property, comes down through my neighbor's property. Um, you know, you might as well get a fishing pole and, and go out there and start fishing. That's how much water comes through these pieces of property. Um, as far as, um, I don't know the intentions of how far he's going to go with um, the the depth of this retaining re retention pond, where the retention pond is going to drain. Um, my, my foundation is at the depth of these foundations that are there now. The foundation close to me drains, okay, but the other one is holding, and it's, it's full of water right now. Um, so the retention pond, like I said, has to have some way to drain out. And there, it, it, needs to be, it needs to be tied into storm drains. And if you look at Beaver Brook that runs along the tracks, they call that, that ditch that runs along the tracks, they call it Beaver Brook. Um, basically, that ditch, okay, is, is abutted by the railroad tracks. And the railroad tracks are gravel. And what happens is the gravel that comes down through there does not go down to the intersection, down, down to the corner of the property, um, Route 3, um, Maple Street, it seeps through, and it comes through all these yards. Um, when the developer built the two houses that are south of me, okay, when he came in there, what he did was he cleared that whole back lot. When I was a kid, that was an open field. Now it's all woods. Um, but what he did was he dropped the level of the grade about two feet. So that's what's causing a lot of the drainage that comes down through the backs of them yards there. And um, my father, my parents, um, and the other people, I believe the Lascos, um, try to divert the water. I mean, they put in drainage. They had, um, you know, other means of trying to get the water to drain down this, you know, to the road instead of coming through our properties and our houses. Um, but since then, land's been filled. Um, when, the, when they put the sidewalks in, my father had a pipe that was coming out of the front of the, of the property. He was told that he had to discontinue it. It was his sump pump. Um, now the sump pump 
sump pump runs out onto the onto our land and it's taken out to our front bank on our on our on our property because basically we have no way the MDC came over and says no you can't hook it into the sewer so basically what you have to do is you have to discontinue that that line there and either pump it out into your yard and like I said it, it makes its way down to the street anyhow um, the pipe that was buried um, the water still trickles through that and any at any time my sidewalk is just you know every every year it's just ice okay the ice builds up I'm, I'm telling you sometimes six inches I can't get out there and chop it basically what I do is I salt and sand it that's the only thing I can do and I've had it where my driveway is just a frozen sheet of ice um, so, you know, so there's, mu there's many things to be addressed on these pieces of property, and there's many things that are to be addressed on that, you know, on the properties behind us. And like I said, if anything, you need to take a bigger picture of the whole photography, photography of what's going on in this area. Because basically, you know, if you're going to talk about property dropping of value of houses and stuff. I would see it very hard to sell my property because of the water problem. And I know that if I've been watching the real estate since God knows, and I've been watching everything from collectibles to antiques. So as far as fair market value and everything, what a lot of people don't realize is back, back from 1989, since the SNL, the property values haven't changed any, okay? So, so basically, if you go with the property values in Connecticut, you'll look and see that the property values in Connecticut are, are at a standstill too. The tax bases keep rising. You know, there's nothing that can stop it. Um, basically, when I was looking up antiques and stuff back in the day, and I went through like Corvell's, um, you know, the antique guides and stuff. What I realized was from the 60s to the 90s, property values and just about everything was gaining. Ten, every 10 years, it was doubling. But since 1990s, say 96, um, since we had the internet, okay, what happened was we had an open society where our values that we had in small little contained units to control the property values since we're, you know, in, we're, since we've had all this, um, Mr. Mr. what do you call it? Mr. Pacheco? It's Mr. Pacheco, right? What's that? Is, your name's Mr. Pacheco? Yes. Okay. Uh, could we try and get this back to- Get back to the, well, I was trying to, so, you know. So the word, you've described drainage issues tonight and in the last public hearing that pre-exist yeah. pre the property and and maybe there's an opportunity in the future as as uh, the owner does something with this and comes back to us for us to capture yeah well i i see it not only it. being as his, his problem i see it as being all of our problem and well with the traffic and everything since the mdc has been doing the work down the street our street was shut off totally um, for the longest time um, so. and we're, we're starting to see a little bit of flow not as much as we are because a lot of people have been going the other way uh, what I've been seeing though is that there's a lot more traffic up at the Solestine Highway trying to get out of these other places and stuff um, there's a there's a big need for you know assessments of the area that need to be taken and, and accounted for um, one of the other things is basically um, if down the road he's going to want to put a, he's going to want to put a, a restaurant in. Um, what I would like to see is that since we are in Old Weathersfield, okay, is that you know I've seen other places like the Standish House, um, Marble Tavern. Um, you know we're all familiar with you know th these places. Um, I would like to see something more in that aesthetics in the neighborhood. And I know that the town is growing and, and you know, if you sit, if you go, say my house is blocked by his building to Solestine Highway. 
So I know when I sit in my backyard, I see the glow on the other side of the highway, on the other side of his property. And I imagine when the trees are all done and you know the leaves are all down, um, the whole Middletown Avenue is going to see the light. Um, and, and as far as noise goes, um, we're near 91. And there's the roar of the traffic that's continuously throughout. You can't tell, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I have a place in Lebanon, Connecticut. Mr. No, Chico, no, no, it, it, it has Mr. something Chico, to do with it. I, we need no, to move on. There's, there's much 30 to do people, with it. 40 people in the room. You cannot, you cannot. I'll, I'll give you 15 seconds to wrap up. I'm just saying, I'm talking, about the, I'm talking about the noise 15 volume. seconds to wrap up. You've had enough time. Okay, but I'm talking about the noise volume. Basically, out in the country, you can, you can hear somebody talking all the way away. If somebody's like 10 feet, 20 feet away from you, we're getting noise traffic regardless. So um, as far as the noise from his building, see, I'm trying to get to, 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 to a place. That's why I've been using these examples. But you're but, monopolizing the, the time. I know, I know. I'm sorry. I apologize. Time. I apologize. So, but so like I said, I, I, I welcome to, him to the neighborhood. I, 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 I took, like I said, I've been traveling around the neighborhood. One night I was coming down Middletown Avenue. Thank, that's, that's no, 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 please, that's, that's please. No, I was coming no, no. and I looked at, I looked at his Pacheco, building. Mr. Pacheco, and it was lit up. It, your, time is, your time is all done. Let's move on to the next person, please. Well, the public said, needs I, to move on. I see your building and, and, and it looks, I, I applaud Mr. your building. Okay? Mr. Pacheco, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Phew, I need to refocus here. Claire Mead, 373 Main Street. Um, everyone has said it really well. I don't need to repeat everything that's been said, but I have to say to you all that we've sat through two really long meetings. I think Barbara Roos finished a sweater in the time. I have, <laughs> I have notes from this meeting. I have notes from the last meeting. And when I come down to it and I think about it, I don't get it. I don't understand, I haven't heard a compelling argument for a zoning change. What I've heard is a wish list from a developer. I've heard access for maintenance. I've heard getting ma major trucks through to a loading dock that's already built. I've heard um, a handicap rep. Let's see, I'll use all these notes that I took. I've heard um, employee parking. I a little bit of talk about that, certainly saw it on the plan. Um, I've heard the need for drainage caused by the paving that's going to be done. But all of these are things, as Barbara Roos said, that the developer knew when he bought the property, absolutely knew when he bought the property. He's presented a phenomenal fait accompli of, I can't do my business without this, when in fact he knew when he bought the property that he was going to need the zoning change. It was a risk he took. Life's risky. It's a risky, it's a risky thing. But that doesn't mean that the Planning and Zoning Commission should cannibalize a neighborhood to accommodate a developer's wish list. So I'm not going to speak any longer. Y'all have heard everything. Thank you very much. Thank you for your volunteerism. Long meeting. You all now have to make a decision. I hope you vote no. If you do, what will happen? He'll still have access to do maintenance. He'll still have the same access to the building that he had when he bought it. He'll still ha the neighborhood will be intact, and y'all will not have set a precedent for spot zoning and for commercial creep. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, uh, Teresa, 174, right across the street from um, the two properties. Um, I spoke last time very briefly, and I will again tonight. Um, I, my home value, according to Zillow, as of yesterday, was about 217000 If I were to try to sell it and get somewhere near that, I would be very surprised once all of this takes place. And I would like to know, if I don't make that, then is someone, is, is Mr. Sulo going to pay me the difference? 
okay? Everyone's saying that this is going to increase our home values, and I really think that's horse pucky. I mean, honestly, does anybody really believe that? Okay, so <laughs> it sounds really good on paper, but we all know that's not true. And we live right across, we are right across the street, so it's just not fair. It's not fair that we pay taxes to the town. Weathersfield is a bedroom community. It was poorly designed from the get-go. It's not our fault. We do have to absorb the brunt of the taxes. I know you guys are hurting for, for, for tax revenue, so it's, it's, it's really, you know, appealing, but um, that's not what we signed up for. We live on Middletown Avenue. We don't live on, on the intersection of Maple Street and Middletown Avenue. Um, we bought our homes knowing that we have neighbors to our left, to our right, and across the street from us. Now we have to look at a pond? I mean, come on, honestly. I don't care if you put flowers around it. It's still garbage. And, and it's just not right. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Anthony Gochi, 321 Middletown Avenue. Uh, the plan that they submitted is showing almost 140 parking places. That's an awful lot of cars that are going to be going up and down Middletown Avenue to add to what we already have there. Their own real estate person said that the street is a nightmare. Those are his words. Okay? Their attorney brought up the property on the Silas Dean Highway where uh, O'Reilly's is and the dollar store is. So I don't know if you folks have ever seen it when people are out there working on their cars in the parking lot or cars are up for sale out there in the parking lot. Okay. The loading docks that are shown here are already built. They're being used. I have pictures of trailer trucks backed into these, okay? I've spoken with Mr. Gillespie. He told me the issue is, is only for them to get access to these doors. They're already getting the access to these doors. The properties that they tore down, there are holes in the ground that you could go ice skating in right now. There's so much water in the holes. They haven't filled them in properly. They haven't leveled the land properly at all, all right? Why would you in give a benefit to a, a developer who's not even doing what he's supposed to do when he was given sea sorters. In reality, you're looking at we the people, our constitution, we the people are at telling you that this is not something we want in the neighborhood. Okay? You really do need to take this and vote it down. And as far as you, Mr. Hughes, you need to go read the commercial driver's license rules you're not allowed to drive a truck unless you can run for five minutes straight, okay? So you're not going to have anybody in a wheelchair getting out of a trailer truck. I can assure you of that. Thank you. Is there anybody else who uh, wishes to speak? Not seeing any hands up at the moment. Would the applicant join us again at the microphone? <laughs> so I really only heard two questions, which is how this started. Um, so is, is the goal limited to what is shown in the concept plan, long-term goal, and how much has been invested to date? And I'll let you answer them if you so choose, but those are the only questions I really heard. I don't really think how much is invested to date is relevant to the zone change application. Mm -hmm. um, we stated what our goal is in regards to the properties that are subject to the zone change application. It's not appropriate or relevant for us to address what other uses we might want to put to 24 Maple Street. Those would be subject of other applications. This is limited to whether or not those properties should be subject to this zone change. And we've told you what our use is intended for those properties. 
place. That's our goal. So, so let me follow up with a question of my own then, because I had a question about the amount of parking that's being proposed. The plan does show 140 spots, and the answer I got to an earlier question was 50, 60, maybe 70. So why are we expanding a parking lot into that area closer to the homes when there's plenty of parking for upwards of the numbers that you're looking for on the current site? Well, I think we can already address that because of the access to the loading docks by the tractor-trailer vehicles. That it needs to be paved, but parking? Well, if you, if you have cars parking here instead of here, it's going to obstruct the turning radius of the vehicles, the, of the tractor trailers. Okay. But if, but if you have a parking lot where you're showing in the yellow area not, here, you can't drive they're there. not driving how through it. <laughs> how will you be able to access with the tractor trailer if you're showing that? The, what if people are parking here? Yeah, track, so that, that, was track, my, that was my question earlier was why not just have 159 and not 165 because if you're showing that as a parking lot if you do like a like auto turn or whatever software you're doing in order to figure out how can I get a tractor trailer in there you only really need the closest property because you need access to those two bays at least that's what you're showing in that plan so uh, I realize there's an opportunity for more but if you're going to show that a tractor trailer is going to pull into one of those aisles where there's cars in there and then backing in. Like, he's not going to pull in south and then back in. He's Yes, he's going to do exactly what your finger's doing. And he only needs the one property. So I was just curious. That that was my earlier question. But now we're sort of following, we're, we're tracking back into that. For the record, Russell Heinz. Um, one of the things is that, I think Joe was talking earlier, is basically two buildings here. You got 80,000 plus square foot building and it's basically separated and, and basically the, the parking I show here and we have an, act, an entrance here and the handicap ramp for the employees can work. Who knows what will happen in the future with that, you know, as far as what way it will be. But that allows to have employee parking for that section of the building. You got employee parking for this section of the building. That's got a handicap ramp in the front. So, and it's, and once again, this is all conceptual. We yeah, tried to show you people something and we really, without the zone change, cannot, and then we will come back with a comprehensive plan. So it's just your feeling that you absolutely need, well, uh, what was it, 40 something more spaces in order to fully use that portion of the building? That's the I think I laid out a parking area there that allows for um, parking, car parking, and, 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 and tractor trailer trucks to, okay. to coexist. So the intensity of the inside of the building and the density of the inside of the building will be achieved, but will you have more traffic flow, meaning will you have 300 trips a day more because of this enhancement, or will you only have 50? Or doesn't it add more? You just get more utility out of the building. Yeah, I mean, I don't anticipate more than maybe more half a dozen trucks a day. Half a dozen trucks a day. And you're still only going to be open 7.30 to 5? Yes. For the trucking activity that you're doing. And, and that's big, that's tractor trailers. Tractor trailers. Then you're going to need UPS and FedEx with smaller trucks. Okay. Because at one time, I think I remember reading, this was used 24-7 with a lot of trucks. Could, that, could the zoning of this building be reestablished using this 24-7 with a whole bunch of trucks again without, a, without them coming here? Uh, we don't regulate the hours that a business is necessarily open. I think Jim, um, Jim had uh, talked a little bit at the last meeting about the, the history of his recollection. I, I can't speak to that. It predates my uh, time here, but nevertheless, it um, certainly could be put to a uh, much more intensive uh, use than, than is proposed by this because have to come before us and the neighbors would have to I'm just I'm talking from my neighborhood in Cumberland Avenue when Northeast Utilities was there with the computer training center we had four or five hundred cars over there 24 7 I like the correct school across the street it's a little quieter now not that that's directly related to the issue <laughs> so thirty to five would be your required hours so so there's only half a dozen 
tractor trailers and some number of, I'll call them single body yeah, you type can, things. If you're down to the average, one day you could have 15 trucks and three trucks the next day. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, because I was looking at the number of loading docks and there's a lot of loading docks, right? Yolanda? I had a, I had a question. Um, just listening to the public uh, speak, um, one of the concerns was about screening, that so much of that existing screening was removed. Now, I know that both of those properties are, are owned by, are owned by uh, Mr. Sulo. But my question is, why, why just rip everything out <coughs> there? Forget the fact that the, that the historic home was, were demolished or the homes were demolished. But like why rip everything out? Because I've driven by there several times since we've had this, this um, our previous meeting. And it just seems like there's, there doesn't seem any much left standing there that was, that was there before. Now maybe I'm wrong, but I mean even lawn or something. Because um, like what, why, why the rush? Like, why did you have to just remove everything? Because even, like, for example, let's say, you know, my parents bought property. They, they own, you know, lots, a lot of lots. My parents don't own the lots. They were developing where there was a lot of lots. Well, every time that developer built a new lot, he would try to protect that per perimeter as much as he could because it would look nicer next to the, to the neighbor. It's like being neighborly. So my question is, why was there so much of that screening removed? Well, number one, to access the building to repair the building. To number repair one, the back building? Yeah, to, to access this part of the building. So that's in the that's further back away from the street from Middletown Correct. Avenue? Correct, correct. Okay. And also, as far as being a good neighbor going forward, that's why we have this conceptual plan. So the intent was to just maybe easier to rip, to take everything down and then just when you're ready to just screen it better. Correct. And, and let's, let, let's not confuse the issues here. Okay. We got permission from the historic district to take the buildings down. That's, that's right. also irrelevant to this application. And I know that's a sensitive subject for the people in the audience tonight, but the fact is it really has nothing to do with this application. You're right about that. Yeah, uh, but what she's getting at uh, still concerns me, even at this point, that I really don't know what's going to happen. And the neighbors don't. And this is why, you know, you go down there, and I, I hate saying this, but when there was uh, a truck sitting there and a pile of stuff stacked five or ten years ago at the corner, approximately where you might someday be putting a restroom. Uh, and it was a lot of brush and shrubbery around that. You couldn't see in there. It was definitely shrouded. And then your client comes in, knocks off the lower branches because they're probably all dead in those pine trees, and then the lights are in there. And I find this disconcerting that I don't know if you're going to do something or not with it. I'm not really sure. Well, and, uh, you know, I, it would be nice, and I hate to say I'm trying to elicit some comment along these lines, but I would like to hear something. What you're going to do about the lights in those trees. All right. And uh, you, don't, so, you don't have to come in with a full plan. Good grief. See, the lights I'm trying to get across to you guys. I replaced them. So I didn't add new lights. They might be brighter because the trees, you can see through them, and half the lights, I don't think any of them worked. There were lights over there. So the lights probably haven't worked for five or eight years before I put them up. But I don't have a problem doing a lighting plan when we go back and do our whole, you know, we have to come back and you have to prove before we do any work over there, before we build a wall, before we put the trees up. We have to get a plan that's agreed to with the town. And I'm, I have no problem changing the lighting. Well, I'm doing something about the visibility 
from around that near nearest neighborhood and the nearest neighbors we're talking about not yeah well when the houses came down it made you know it made the view a lot it opened it up a lot more peter does that make sense to you what are you saying which which of those answers george are you talking about What he just said, he said he's got to come back with plan and the lighting. And so I, I think you know, uh, he didn't answer with the three. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Sulo and I are going to have a conversation, you know, in the next couple of days about the lighting. The lighting changed, uh, as he just testified. When lighting changes like that, it's got to comply with our, um, you know, uh, night sky requirements. So oh, yeah. those fixtures should have very serious. Those si that. fixtures That's should fine. have been installed in a different way. So we'll have a separate conversation in terms of the impact to the evergreens. Um, you know, the, the yeah, I don't know what to do. About yeah, that. there isn't uh, a much I think uh, at this point that can be done other than maybe planting another row. But I, I don't know at the end of the day that it's going to ultimately uh, impact it. Uh, it's sort of water under the bridge, unfortunately, at this point. But the lighting, I think, um, certainly needs to be. Uh, I'm going to look at it and just see what maybe we need to do in the meantime. Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions from the commission to the applicants. Yeah, but I was, um, maybe Rich could explain it, uh, one of our attorneys. Uh, we, we have an opinion from our town attorney that the audience isn't aware of about spot zoning and some of the couple of the basics on what it is and what it isn't. Can that, do we want to explain that for the benefit of the people here? Um, no, I think the two people gave explanations of spot zoning, and I think they were both reasonably yeah, that's accurate. True. And they're reasonable that yeah. that's not. Well, uh, they're so not. I, I don't think anyone has. I mean, it, it's clear. We have to figure out the answer. I mean, yeah, you know. I agree with you. Okay. And what the plan of conservation development is versus the. The zoning plan, all right? You mean the comprehensive plan? Comprehensive plan, that's what I was asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, you really take plan. both of them into account. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. And we typically do, right? I mean, they're, they're overriding policy documents with relatively little specificity with particular sites, you know? All right, I'm not seeing any more questions for the applicant, but before we close the hearing, is there anybody who wants to offer a new thought that hasn't already been expressed at this point? All right. Hearing none. Make a motion to close. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. All right, would anybody like to start? The dialogue. So, if not, then I'll start it by simply, re you know, doing what George was kind of getting to, starting the dialogue about, you know, uh, whether any one of us, you know, is comfortable with the spot zoning. Um, the stuff is in the in the in the packet here from our legal counsel as to the definition of it. Um, was the other thing I wanted to say. Also, that again, we need six positive votes rather than the normal five out of the nine of us to, to pass the proposal. Um, let me just, you know, I'll, I'll start with, I'll start with the, uh, the appraisal, right? So, um, or the market analysis. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not swayed by the market analysis. I don't think it was a particularly good document. Um, I, I don't think it has really any relevance or proof of what the situation will be. I don't necessarily think in the long run this will affect property owners. I think the unknown affects property owners, and we've gone through this many times before when people have rezoned um, other larger parcels for uh, high-density housing, et cetera. And the, and the market analysis that we, we often have presented to us gives us examples of other places in other communities where they did the same thing and they tracked 
the value of properties over time in these other communities post and pre, right? <laughs> this offered nothing of that, right? This, this was just a historical record of values for the last three years somewhere in the neighborhood. Yeah, okay, so what? We don't know what that's doing today, tomorrow, in the future as we do something with this property. But as we've often heard in other market analysis, things, things have a short-term impact. Things like this development in a neighborhood has short-term impacts, but not long-term impacts. Stuff happens, particularly when the ground is churned up. Nobody knows what's going in. Five years later, it's kind of all forgotten. It is what it is, and the market rebounds back to what it was as if nothing ever changed. That's my perception of the basics of market appraisals. Um, and, but, I'm, but I'm sure if someone tried to sell a house today, anywhere within visual eyesight of this property, it would probably turn a, a buyer away. And so we all know it's all supply and demand. And if there's less demand, there's probably less value in the property, right? So, so I think, you know, I, I'm, I've always thought these sort of things are short-term, not long-term. They don't necessarily um, um, keep me from, from voting positively for them if I think there's other values. There are also some darn good, darn unfortunate irregularities in the way this has rolled out, right? And we find ourselves once again in a position where stuff has happened and, you know, um, we may be inclined to vote positive when, in fact, you know, if, if nothing had been started, we might otherwise be thinking completely differently. You know, the houses are down, properties are cleared, um, work is gone and permits, you know, don't seem to have been in place at the right time. Others have already <coughs> given approvals to do things that have, you know, put us in this position. So those, those are things that are going through my head, none of which I hope um, the way I just said it indicates an inclination. Those aren't because I was trying not to show an inclination. Um, I'm just talking points. I don't know how anybody else feels about those issues. But sooner or later, we're going to have to indicate our inclinations. Yeah, I guess I kind of, there was the comment of we're sort of backed into this corner <coughs> of sure anything that gets done to that property now is going to make it look better because it's two giant holes. So like, I kind of resent that aspect of the situation. I think that's, there's the argument of whatever we do is going to make it look better. Yeah, that's true, but only because the bomb went off. So I guess that's my sort of take on that. I think my concern going forward is if it, if this gets denied or if this gets approved, in which situation do we have, or does the town, maybe not us, do, which situation do we have more control over what happens? And it, it sounds like if it's rezoned, we have more control, but there's also more question marks. So that, like, that's the thing that I until, struggle with. Is until I, you go to that next level and find out what. Because until that's what, that happens. Because right, the neighborhood but doesn't then, know what's going in. But then nobody knows what's happening. So, But if it stays residential, to your point, uh, we can just leave it, right? Put a white or, like they can't let it blight. They, they need to make it. So then that's exactly what they would potentially plan anyway is making it look nice and eventually trees grow there. And, you know. and, and, and keep in mind, Peter made this comment that those properties, as they exist as residential, mm -hmm. will never be part of a site plan remediation effort on the commercial one. So there will be no drainage solutions provided right. within the existing parking lot of the site. Which means we have like less control drainage-wise, less control in some other aspects of it. It's just trying to figure out in, including including buffering. So yeah. you take those properties out, now you try and put buffering on the existing parking lot, not the, not the residential properties, because mm -hmm. that's not part of the same site. That's like going on somebody else's property now, mm -hmm. right? Is that what you want either, right? Yeah, and that's, I, I don't know. I'm trying to wrestle with that. Yeah, going off Commissioner Alley, I, uh, 
only looking at the zone change, not what could be, might be next week, 5, 10, 20, 100 years out, about site control. And it's, I clearly understand from anyone's point of view, you need to get a zone change if there's going to be any type of improvement or change, good, bad, or indifferent. And then if it's, if something is even going to happen there, whether it's you create the existing property or with or without these lots, to do that, they have to come back with a total comprehensive plan, photo metrics, the whole banana parking plan, environmental drainage, sediment control, the whole banana to, to do pretty much anything because then now that encompasses the whole property, every component, not just these two boxes. And then we have it, then we have a lot more impact control over it, whether it's the current owner or future owner, and to to decide. And we have the, the ability to make uh, have control of the whole site not the, the pine trees that were trimmed or whatever it be or how, it how it truly impacts the whole neighborhood uh, turn control so people can't make a southerly turn out of a Middletown Avenue driveway so you can't make a right you have to go there and those types of things that, that's I see how you the control so what do you envision if if these stay residential, oh, what do I think would happen? They well, would stay. They would stay grassy, and we would we would see the building. Is that that kind of worst case scenario I, here? You know what? It, but that's also. That, but it's also. But either one's a guess. I don't know. But I just say the control is if there's if there is a next step when this changes, and it seems like from the the practical side of me says, well, if I owned it, you're going to dry it out because you, you need to drive the property with the, with the retention pond and those types of things. And uh, to improve your site and just make it more valuable to you, obviously he's, he's made a, an investment so far, so we, and he bought the property, so why would he only stop at the last 10% to create his drainage and, and drive the whole site, you know, as best he can in, in a pre-established soggy spot. But, um, but as a residential zone, it would, you know, it's, it, he may try and dry it out, but it's either going to be resold. But he's not going to dry out the commercial site that pre-exists. No. That's the whole thing. Yeah, right. maybe the two building lots no. will dry out, but the whole scenario is not in any of the abutting neighbors because you have far more area of expertise than these days, the two of you. Than I do, but I just if you solve a piece of the puzzle, it's got to help the larger puzzle or potentially help the larger puzzle of that drainage situation. I, I, I say it, but. Well, the other the thing with the drainage situation, and it, it's a conceptual idea, but if we're putting in something like a detention pond where you're going to have to outlet that water somewhere, which will be to some storm system on a road, right. you also have a pond right next to a sidewalk. So that would have to be fenced and screened and there's whole owner's liability. But, but that said, it is, it is quite a conundrum. Um, I wanna say that I just don't feel reassured how this site is gonna be en enhancing the neighborhood. Developers have opportunities to enhance neighborhoods, whether it's a commercial development whether it's an industrial development, whether it's a residential development, they have opportunities to enhance a neighborhood. We have spent two days, two evenings, long, long evenings with the public that has still chosen to sit here at 1030 in the evening. And every, I think almost, every single one of the residents is opposed to this for a lot of different reasons. It took a lot of effort, I feel. It took a lot of effort to get all these signatures, to, to show up with young children or older children and to speak up, to speak up whether they were comfortable speaking up or not. And I know that everyone on this commission has heard them. So I, I repeat, I am not reassured that all these improvements 
are going to enhance the neighborhood, any improvements, future improvements. And I know that today we're talking about a zone change, but there's tomorrow, and there's three years from now, and there's 10 years from now. And that zone change is still going to be in effect. So my position is not in favor of this because I'm listening to the public. I'm listening to the neighborhood and I'm trying to put myself in their situation. I am not reassured. That's all I have to say. So appreciate that, Yolanda. Um, let me, let me go down through my notes and just give me a second to. So in terms of um, the plan of conservation and development, right, and this applicant's uh, or the application's consistency with it, um, I don't find it to be contrary to. It's one of those, you know, this is such a great document, right, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, this is all about your opinion. I don't find uh, a swaying argument for or against the fact that this is inconsistent or not in, or not consistent right? or consistent, um, I, I, it's it's too small an area. It's adjacent to the commercial development. Um, is there a significant impact long term um, with the fact that this parcel is two small lots bigger? You know, ten years from now, um, I I don't know that that's a a big incremental change. I can I could find this consistent. Um, I I don't necessarily see that it's a benefit, right, to the neighborhood. Um, it clearly benefits the property owner, right. Um, I don't know that it's improving anybody's property values adjacent or down the street or anywhere else. I think it has the potential to increase traffic albeit with site controls, we could certainly try and limit that, right? Um, so I, so if your criteria is that it should benefit, in order to change the zone, it should benefit the neighborhood, that's a, you know, that's a high bar in my opinion. I don't know that it's benefiting it. It's benefiting the property owner. Um, I don't know that traffic volumes could get much worse. I don't know that any development here, um, really matters or is going to change the traffic climate. You know, it's, you know, that came out in the, in the value report. I'm not sure why, but, <laughs> um, you know, it, there's too much background volume here already. This is not going to make or break anything. It's my opinion, you know, because we would try and control it if it, went, if it happened. So, but overall, I just, I don't see that it's benefiting the neighborhood. And you can make an argument that, you know, in this particular case, the neighborhood is a historic neighborhood. Does that mean it's somehow different or stronger than Joe Burrow's neighborhood? And removing a parcel or two from it means more than <coughs> removing a parcel or two, i.e. the creek discussion is more significant on this neighborhood because it's part of a historic district. Uh, you know, I, throw out it, I throw it out, I don't necessarily buy into it. I'm just, I, I would certainly understand an argument if somebody made that. No, you cannot. Yeah, no, I was you cannot. Just wondering. Yeah, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Did no, you I say you can't hear? Oh, I'm very sorry. Yes, yeah, I could. Uh, I can address right. that. I could address that. I'm sorry about that. Wish you'd spoken up earlier. <laughs> I, I can't start over. I, from, you know. <laughs> um, hopefully, my commission members heard that, and that it prompts a dialogue, <laughs> one way or the other. I, you know, I, I guess in the end, I'm, I'm not swayed that it is a positive attribute, you know, if, if I got to be more blunt about it. I don't see it as a big downer. And certainly in, a sh in long term, I don't see it as being um, all that bad. Um, but it's certainly not a benefit to the neighborhood. And if you put, if you put some extra criteria on the historic nature of this neighborhood somehow being more important than Joe Blow's neighborhood, then, I, you know. So. Right. I, I wasn't at the last meeting, so I spent a significant amount of time the last couple of days 
looking through the staff reports, the public testimony. I read all of the public testimony, very sensitive to the neighborhood issues. We had the same type of situation on my part of town. The legal opinion was very strong, very thorough, very complete. The definition of a comprehensive plan and a master plan comes into play. Um, there were some positive things with Mr. Lamont's uh, appraisal, but again, it, it was limited, I think, and I agree with you, John. Uh, but the, the, I, I don't see, I see any positives as I look back in my couple years on EDIC 15, 16 years ago, and we really focused on our 40 mil rate, our effective tax rate being one of the highest in Greater Hartford. The limited testimony that came through, the limited amount of commercial property we had. And it's very few developers that we've had come into town, come into this board, already have invested millions of dollars. There's a couple million dollars here, and there's potential for sixty to seventy thousand dollars of property tax to go up to 110, 120 thousand in property tax. That's another school teacher, possibly. How about the truck? That's inclusive yeah, of the trucks, the business property. personal property, and the real estate. That's where I was going when I talked to the appraiser on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the intensity of the, of the inside of this building, highest and best use. One of the public statements was that we don't we have a lot of vacancy, and when you value those properties, you don't have a net operating income or cash flow on that property. Uh, it's difficult to appraise it at a high value when you have vacancy. This property owner is looking to intensify, and those are the words. I think I used intensify and in density within the physical building. So if you say it doesn't have any positive effect, I think you're wrong, because there is an economic financial positive effect here. Um, one of the other uh, taxpayers was saying that two out of the three corners are commercial properties, they're not residential. And maybe it's not the weather so green, but you know, it's not the weather so green. Let's be honest, maybe it's not Comstock Ferry or a small building that uh, wants to intensify the use intensify their landscaping, but it is a positive thing for a, a property that I really thought, uh, well, these pictures are rude. It's, it's not, if it's not a blighted property, I don't know what is. And this gentleman came into this town to invest it. And in the corner of, uh, of uh, Silas Dean and Jordan Lane is, is a property that has two or three vacant buildings there, but that sat empty for what, a decade? Uh, the, the Northeast Utility site sat empty, what, for a decade? Um, you know, uh, we watched construction on that one for almost nine, ten months with steel girders banging the floors, banging the ground so loud it did uh, some disruption to the neighborhood. But and there Tony, are some I, I don't so think it's, those it's a pictures. gateway property, and there are. I'm just saying there are. Some, when I drive in the town and I see that now, <coughs> the facade program alone, what 60, 70 properties, Peter. That's been a miracle for this town, and this is another property that has some positives. So, so you would describe the positives on the broader community rather than the neighborhood. Broader community, rather than yep. just the neighborhood. That's and that, and that That's standard right. is the standard that we need to apply, uh, you know, in in every case because we're we're not charged with, you know, protecting particular neighborhoods or particular interests in particular neighborhoods, but for the protection and the enhancement of the overall community. Um, one of my concerns uh, is that in, in hearing uh, much of the testimony uh, that, that, that has been presented here, uh, particularly from the residents, and we need to be very sensitive to their concerns and their, their apprehensions, um, is that is the effects of what has already been done uh, with respect to uh, the applicant's uh, uh, purchase and use of the property that, that he has. And from what I can tell, what he has done, uh, there hasn't been very much enhancing for the neighborhood, has been due to the fact that he was able to do uh, everything he's done, demolish the houses, uh, clear the brush, clear the screening, uh, replace the light bulbs on, on the uh, on the current lighting on the building it's all legal he's 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 been able to do all the all this unregulated the only real practical means that we have to hopefully um, uh, bring this property into uh, you know the the mainstream of Weathersfield values and and our uh, you know, 
our plan of conservation and development and, and really compliance with the current regulation since my presumption is you know, this building built, built in 1956 has a lot of grandfathering with respect to what's there now. And we know that there are n numerous problems with, with the site, particularly drainage and um, also traffic pattern. And that creates safety issues. Uh, and of course, the, the lighting. Whatever he does, once if these two properties are incorporated into this and he does you know, develop the overall parcel, uh, this commission then has regulatory authority over what uh, the applicant does with the parcel. We have next to no regulatory authority uh, with this current use. And in order for us to be able to be in a position to protect the community, uh, protect the community at large, to protect the interests of the neighbors, is the uh, review and uh, establishment of, of conditions and uh, granting permission or denial of any future development, whether it's in drainage, whether it's in the architecture of the building that affects uh, the, the topography of, of the land, uh, uh, issues of, of, of screening, landscaping, all of this becomes subject to our regulatory authority which we don't have over the property right now if it just sits as it is now. Or if, he, if he's able to, if he continues, to, or if he, if he pursues a policy of doing everything he can do under the current regulations um, with his property that's not going to be really subject to uh, you know, regulatory review. Well, how about this? If it stays residential, it's useless to him. He ends up selling it. It stays residential. Somebody builds on it, and then the town has some regulatory oversight, and it as a residential lot. Is that not true? I, I'm I'm not, asking actually. I, I, mean I said it, it as a statement, but I'm asking. If you think in terms of overall, you know, buffering of the building and some of the issues that were raised by the oh, neighbors. No, no, no. no, I just mean in terms of just what is done on it, the lot. They like would come in and get a building there. permit. Yeah. Uh, if you build a residential house yeah. on it, single family residence, yeah. not a lot of you don't, that, you, it, oh, no, that, I, I that get, whole, won't, that, that issue won't some. be coming before us either. He just, you know, whoever is the developer of that, you know, you know, build, builds a house, gets a building permit and does it. And so long as it meets the, you know, the regulations of the, mm -hmm. of the town as is, he can do whatever he wants. And the only way of, of having uh, essentially an overall plan of development that is that is consistent with you know what I, I would think we want to achieve for the community at large uh, is by the review of any you know, uh, plans that he brings in for the future development of the property, and the only way that that's going to happen is if we have uh, you know a, approval of the uh, of the two lots. So I, I it's sort of an obtuse you know, reasoning, but my feeling is that the only practical way of really having us to have uh, practical input and review and approval authority over what goes on here is by uh, granting the, the request for the, uh, um, uh, for the inclusion of the, these lots into the commercial property. But let me ask you a question. Let me ask the commission a question. If, if the developer bought the property, he didn't take down the historical homes, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't take down Correction, the homes, he didn't Correction, ma'am. These do were anything. not historical homes. They were not historical to begin with. If my, it was in the historic district. But it does, the point is, if the developer came in and in my mind did it the proper way which would be to request the zone change without really impacting those properties so in other words if we were sitting here tonight and those and those two proper just want you to think of it a different way okay if we were sitting here tonight and there there's two residences there that the develop that a person bought and he'd like to change it in a different zone but right now, we're looking out the window and we're seeing that there's two houses there, 
and there's two lots that are untouched because that developer is waiting for a zone change. Would that change your opinion? You don't have to answer that, but I just, you know, it's something to think about. It's because I feel like I, I, I definitely understand what you're, what you're saying, um, you know, these members on the commission. I understand what you're saying. You're trying to protect the neighborhood and you're trying to be able to regulate things too. But at the same time, isn't that sort of setting a precedent that someone could come in and start doing whatever they want on certain things and then we have to figure out back into it and how are we gonna solve this problem? You know, it's, it, to me it comes down to, to your conscience, like doing the right thing. And in terms of, we're looking at a bigger neighbor, the bigger community, not just the neighborhood on, on middle, uh, Middletown Avenue. But my, I feel that that community affects my community across the town because there's a trickle down effect. Every single piece of our town affects every other piece. We're all interrelated, so to speak. So, so it's just a different way of looking at it. And that's why it's good to have that dialogue out loud amongst ourselves and, and to the public because really we don't normally have this dialogue you know, in private. It's always in, in the public eye. So I don't really know what your opinions are. I don't know what your votes are going to be. But that's what I wanted to say. But we're not, we, weren't, we don't have a time machine. Basically, the developer, again, took the houses down with historical districts saying it was okay. Now he's making a gesture to the people across the street in the neighborhood to invest, you know, thousands of dollars in a wall and arbor bodies. You put 10 foot arbor bodies there, you're not going to see that warehouse. Again, we're in a situation where it's a what do we do best for the neighborhood and what do we do best for the town? And what he's presenting, probably he's the best answer. Because I don't think he's gonna go drop, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, maybe hundred thousand into two homes there. That's not for his best interest. So what he's done is he's doing what's for the town. He's growing the town, and I can say in this town, in my lifetime, I've seen major re restaurants disappear, businesses disappear. Basically, I believe because of demographics, but Weathersfield at one time was a thriving, you know, interstate highway with businesses. Now we're lucky if we can rent the storefronts. I think his gesture to the neighborhood is probably the best thing we got going for this site. And if we can get other businesses to come to this town, invest in restaurants, shopping centers, like with big anchor stores, it's best for us. I, w I wish we could send back the time machine and put those houses there and present it that way. But again, the historical he said, take them down. He's made his best gesture, well, and I'm all for the change. You don't, I mean, you don't need a time machine. As long as it's a residential zoned lot, there's a potential house there, right? I guess the only use. Uh, that's just my counter to that. Like, it's, it's sort of in line with Yolanda. Like, yes, houses are gone. They're mm -hmm. gone. But right now, what do you use those lots for? There's only one use. As, as far as is I there, see it. Is there another use? Oh, as far as I see it, you went and got approval. Trees, that's better. You went and got approval to demo these from HDC. That was there. That has nothing to do with us. No, no. That, that, and so he, that was his step one. What I said doesn't come need. No, but it just kind of walk. I'm walking it through so I hear your feedback. I understand it just as... And going off the appraiser, other projects where you want to have more buffer or cushion around your building, mm -hmm. it, especially when you have a large operation of 80 plus thousand square feet, to knock the houses down, I'm just willing to bet the level of investment he's at already, he can afford with taking those houses off there, drops his taxes on those two properties, probably more than in half. It's not much. So, it's just going to stay vacant. He's, I doubt he would build, and if he's going to build something there, I bet it would be high density as far as like a multifamily or something of that nature. I'm just speculating. But I just go back to what you said about control and having positive effect in the neighborhood. If anybody wants to do anything on that site, and this these two pieces are now, I'll use the word encumbered into this one square, 
we have control of the whole thing. Lighting, use, what he can and can't do on the site, that includes the two lots, uh, the, all the buffering, landscaping, parking, the whole, everything, if he wants to do anything on it. And that's the only way we can do anything to improve or make a positive change, as you said, into the neighborhood. What they want actually done. The houses, the houses are gone. He got approval to do it, and he did it for financial reasons. I'm sure, it, just like any construction or developer would do. That's just the way he didn't just. I'm guessing he didn't just do it because he wanted to blow money and roll dice. I was kind of rolling dice with a lot. But it's a business, <laughs> you know. I, as a yeah. business, he, you know, to have to get to have that clear. Not have a residence there, and you know, I, I, I can see it. George? Yeah, I kind of agree with Yolanda's first statement. And uh, in addition, and Tony, the pictures that you saw of the building look at, make it look worse than it is. I don't know who came up with them. But the building looks good, and I've been over there twice. Now, maybe I'm getting half blind, but I don't think so in my old age. <laughs> Uh, no, it, they, it really looks a lot better than those pictures show it. Um, and I agree with her because I still think, even if we turn it down tonight, I don't think we have to say without prejudice or anything like that, which for the audience that means they can come back next week. Uh, there is no restriction on when they could come back again, right, with a full, full plan. Is that correct? Peter? Yeah. Do you think the developer is going to come back and go through and this one more time, change, George? Change in do, to do, do it to accommodate whatever else they want to well, do. And what's going to change your? I mean, you think this developer is going to come back and go through this this effort again? And what what would have changed for you to change your opinion? You have the decision at your hands tonight, and you should make that decision because based like on that. Land that we don't feel. Some of us don't feel we have enough information. He came in with the information you asked him to come in with. I mean, what other information? I don't think they provided it. I, I think he provided it more than required by your regulations. So, you, you know, you're creating a standards that don't exist in your regulations. You're uh, bound I by your regulations. I still say, Peter, before you got here and in the past, we have considered these things together, a zone change and a plan. You didn't have it in your regulations, then, no, George. It may not be required, but it's, it's something we think makes sense because then you know more what you're doing. George, what you're I doing. understand what you're saying, but unfortunately, our, we are between two white lines to make a decision here. It's zone change only. I, we can't look into the crystal ball and say we're gonna, what, what he is or isn't going to do, what the property owner, five people after him are going to do. But all I can say is when they want to do something, if he wants to open, put a merry-go-round in his parking lot. Oh, you assume this, he's going to sell on. this because he doesn't get the zone change? No, I'm, I have no idea. Said? I have no idea, but just. Well, that's what you implied. Just no, now. but to protect ourselves down the road as be, or have impact on this property down the road, <laughs> if they want to do anything, they have to come <coughs> back to us, and we get to then. I know. As you said, no, and, 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 and you brought but up But in the meantime, point, nothing's too. being done, and I'm not sure that they will We do can't it. force anyone to do anything. They haven't even verbally suggested they might do it. But we're only at step one, and I understand, as we've seen other developers come in here, to spend a tremendous amount of money, more than buying these two properties, just to do the engineering. Oh, I know that. Right, so if he's, it, why would you do all the engineering and all the hydrology in all the photometric plans when you, you may be taking out two chunks of the property and then all that needs to be redone. So I get it. I get it. So look, I'll be very blunt with my fellow commissioners here and just for the audience. <laughs> As a Republican, I feel kind of stupid, but I think I'll be vote, I'm pretty sure I'll be voting against this. Normally you think we're supposed to be in favor of businesses and economic development. I still think there's a different approach to the way they can come to this commission. And that's what I'm saying. So, you know, you can argue with me all you want. I'm well, not I'm not arguing you. with you. It's not an argument. I'm just no, no, I'm looking well, at the other well, side of the... You're making a case. You've, set, you've been spoken two or three times. I, well, I'm just no, looking at it from the other side of the street, George. We're good. We're good, thank you.
been awful quiet. You just take it in the hallway. I'm going to try to be as quiet as I'm super I curious about Bridget's opinion. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> would somebody like to make a motion and, and speak to a motion in particular? And as you know, historically, we prefer to make a motion that's a positive motion and see if it passes. George, should I make the motion? Do whatever I, you'd like to do. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint you. <laughs> I'll make the motion. I make the motion that we approve uh, application 2005-18-Z. And I'm, listen, I'm willing to listen to your input, my fellow commissioners. Torres. So, so would there be a need to put any yeah, conditions on I was, I was wondering this? if there would be. There are no conditions, but I think you need to um, have a speak, uh, to speak to the reasons. And I think um, the town attorney had given you your your opinion. There's uh, four uh, tests that he's uh, advised you to consider. Uh, the first being um, the consideration of the plan of conservation and development. And Tom spoke a little bit <coughs> to that earlier. Secondly. Um, Looking at the benefits to the, com I'm looking at um, page, is there a page, the last page, I guess, of um, his memo uh, under the paragraph called recommendations. So it's the third paragraph in the section referred to as recommendations. So the first would be the plan of conservation and development, making sure that gets factored into your decision. Uh, two, looking at the benefits uh, to the community as a whole, not just the applicant. Uh, number three, uh, the test is, does this have a significant impact on the overall character of the neighborhood, what they're asking for? And then fourth, uh, is this a natural extension of the current business park zoning district boundaries? Um, and does that uh, support growth and economic development? So those are the four uh, considerations he's in advising you to make sure the record uh, discusses. So as you make that decision, you need to be thinking about those four things. And those four recommendations circle, at least a couple of them circle back to these, his advice on the spot zoning issue, which, I'm sorry, thank you. <coughs> and the, uh, the four points that he brings up are inclusive of the two points that have been discussed tonight about the spot zoning and, and what, what doesn't constitute spot zoning. And, and one of, one of those being, well, what, what would constitute would be being a small parcel, and we all know it's a relatively small parcel. So the second issue is, um, the, the second issue being, is it out of harmony? Is it consistent with the comprehensive plan? Of con uh, concept? Comprehensive plan. It's getting late. Comprehensive yes. plan, um, and whether the central purpose is changing a positive change for the community as a whole. Right. So those, that is captured in the four points that he makes as part of his recommendation. So if you're considering those four points, you'll be wisely considering the application. All right. So, so no specific. No conditions. No specific conditions, nope. but. Um, I think you, re you rely on what the applicant has told you in, in terms of his plans. You can't condition right. um, those uh, <coughs> plans that you have in front of you on this. I think you rely on the the word of the uh, developer and you have regulatory authority regardless uh, of what happens uh, in, in on those properties and um, you you let it let it go forward or uh, against with all of that being factored into it all right so so mr. Hughes you made a motion uh, would you care to elaborate on the four points in support of uh, the positive motion Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I think we eight or nine eight or nine of us have already touched on that with some of our yep. observations. I think as Mr. Dean had mentioned with the the, uh, the town wide issues, but I touched base on some of the things with EDIC and some of the history and some of the applications we've had in place. And I, I appreciated the, this definition, especially when it came into the comprehensive plan and how it ties into the master plan. Uh, 
think Mr. Roberts is the only one who hasn't given us too much information. And <laughs> maybe it's just a little bit of a headache or a shy day, but so I welcome any communication. <laughs> So would someone like to second the motion before we forget to do so? I'll second the motion. Thank you, Tony. I'm going to keep the wrong angle. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I have been listening with tremendous interest to this conversation. Um, I purposely was keeping quiet because I've been accused of being pushy and a bully. And we can't hear you. <laughs> oh, sit in the front row. <laughs> No, I see. Closer to the mic. Like you yeah. told me a couple times. Quite loud. Yeah. No, I, 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 in all seriousness, I've, I've been listening to the discussion because, you know, I, I, I find this to be a complicated situation. I mean, we have to kind of divorce, you know, maybe some of the unpleasant history of how we got here from the perfect world of where we would want to be. Um, you know, if you got into the Wayback Machine to 1955, wow. you know, I, I question, you know, George was probably sitting in the same seat then, but, um, <laughs> you know. I, uh, no, I wish I were. Okay. No, I, 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 okay. Well, no, I mean, well, seriously, well, whether, well, whether well, you know, whether it would have made sense to have zoned these two yeah. parcels BP in the first place since they are, you know, essentially surrounded by it. And, um, you know, I, I think that intact residential neighborhoods are one of the essential characteristics of Wethersfield. And, you know, to have it kind of whittled away is unfortunate. And, you know, the whole actions with the HDC you know, it is what it is. You play the hand you're dealt, whatever cliche you want to use. And um, I guess the, the types of arguments that I've been hearing tonight that sway me are that, you know, on the one hand, keeping it as it is is unlikely to create a better situation for the neighbors, either in the short run or the long run. And making the zone change and adding it to this property and providing us with the opportunity to regulate, monitor, and have some degree of control and oversight over the development and operation of the property is more likely to create a better outcome for the neighborhood in terms of, you know, turning down the lights, putting up better trees, creating a more effective buffer, um, you know, providing meaningful controls on hours of operation, means of operation that may be problematic to the more existing, you know, the, the more close neighbors, um, providing the opportunity for some kind of meaningful drainage improvement, both for this site and for, you know, some of the neighbors. Um, and, you know, obviously and, and not surprisingly, it, it could have a financial benefit for the owner. Um, but I guess, you know, I kind of look at it from the perspective of, I don't believe it's spot zoning because although it's a, a small area, it's you know a small area that we're not changing the zone to industrial or you know to to something completely incongruous. It, it's just basically matching, you know, the property that surrounds and dominates it, um, and having kind of consistent opportunities to develop and manage, um, you know, a property of this size at a location as important as this, um, I think there is some benefit to getting it kind of under the umbrella of 
you know, commercial zoning regulations where we have significant site plan regulations rather than, you know, hoping someday somebody throws up another house there, um, you know, because, you know, frankly, that's, that's the only positive outcome I can see of keeping it residential because otherwise it's going to be, you know, cellar holes and brambles and, you know, people remembering what used, used to, to be, be there. there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've kind of, over the last couple of weeks, you know, I haven't talked to anybody about this. Um, I haven't really paid attention to the paper or TV or anything. Um, you know, and I've talked myself into and out of, you know, <laughs> both opinions numerous times. And, and I guess, you know, that's why I kind of wanted to sit here and, and, you know, not see which way the wind was blowing, but to hear what other people were thinking. And, you know, I, I can't say enough that this is by no means in, you know, ignoring what the public has said. It's just, I don't know how denying the zone change is going to make things the way they used to be or even make things significantly better than they are right now. Um, and that, um, as, you know, as, as much as we've kind of been painted into the corner and have to figure out how to get out of it, I, I think, you know, changing the zone, adding it to this property, and then, you know, regulating it and having the appropriate hearings whenever, um, you know, any kind of development is contemplated for, for the property is, is going to be the only effective way that we will be able to protect your interests going forward. Um, you know, we can't undo what the HDC did. I wish we could, but, you know, the the only positive step that I think we can take now is to, you know, is to get this into a, a situation or a condition where, where we are better able to regulate future outcomes. So you're so, sorry you asked for more. So no, actually, yes. no, actually, I'm uh, very grateful of it because it, it Said it very succinctly, and and to the you know to the four basic points: is it aligned with the plan of conservation and development and the zoning regs? It's not inconsistent. It's not misaligned. It's you know, I, and I and I do think there are m more potential positives if we control it than than if we don't, um, because it's not going to get another residential house rebuilt there. Uh, that's not going to happen. So, so I do see the brambles. Uh, point, point of order or question really for Peter. In the resolution, um, would it not be proper consistent with the uh, town attorney's opinion that we've been given to uh, amend the resolution to some extent to s basically uh, state, state, that state this upon consideration of all the evidence and testimony and so forth in the total in its totality that the commission finds uh, uh, that number one uh, the the uh, uh, the zone change is aligned with the provisions of the plan of conservation and development and the zoning regulations uh, for the town number two would benefit the community as a whole and not just the applicant and three and four is, is further stated in the opinion. We should we so state that you know formally within, I, the, I within think, the language of the I think you've just stated it um, in the Personal. considerations and deliberations you're making right now for the record. Uh, and then depending upon how the vote goes, those four criteria uh, would stand as the uh, conversation and the deliberation you know, to support the, the because decisions. Because they, they are our ultimate conclusion yeah. to find it. You've all touched on all of these four things during all of the back and forth. Uh, Rich uh, touched on them just, and you just reinforced uh, those four, at least uh, that was your words and your, your opinion on that. So I think that would um, clearly be reflected in the, uh, if, if the record were to be reviewed uh, at some point in the future. Thank you. Yeah. 
So, so I don't find it inconsistent for the first one. The second one, benefiting the community as a whole, not just the applicant. Um, you know, Tony, I appreciate your clarification that the community may, you know, maybe is appropriately defined larger than the immediate neighborhood um, from from tax base purposes. And and I'm and I'm. I, I just I don't disagree with what you said. You know that these properties probably should have been zoned business in the first place way back when because it's it's a weird zone uh, creation as it exists now. Um, so and the third, uh, you know, I already stated I don't think it has a significant impact on the character of the general neighborhood, um, and and it obviously is is not a. It's not inconsistent to say this is a natural extension of what already exists as a business area. Uh, the, the properties the properties that are left adjacent to the business zone are the same property it is the same property that is adjacent to the property the business zone property now so it really doesn't change the character in that regard either even to the most adjacent neighbor so. and for a neighbor that, that is fairly new in town from Florida and reference the mandate and the criteria of this four page legal opinion is something you might want to look at it does reference case law and nine different references anyway on it, you know, the requirements of the statutory mandate be within our conservation plan development or by case law that must be adhered to. Mm -hmm. where the, that's where the four bullets come into play. Yeah. And, and I, I kind of stated my position before that the, the unknowns of a site development are what drive, in my opinion, evaluation of the adjacent properties right and we won't get to a known state to a stable state until something happens right um, and until an, until it gets resolved and, and just having it unresolved doesn't fix anything so. yeah, I, mean, I think uh, everybody's kind of doing the math in their heads but I still think the vote that I'm going to cast is going to be of we should have been having this conversation before anything happened on the lots. That's my opinion. So if we, if you vote one way, it's just like, well, all right, may as well benefit from it. So that, that, I think that's why it's just not sitting well with me. So. No, and, it, and you know, I mean, and I hear you, and that, that was one of the things that I was struggling with. It's just, you know, do you reward bad behavior on one hand or do you punish good behavior on the other hand yeah. and um, it, it's not easy all right is there anybody who wishes to add more comment all right all the question all the question all those in favor and please acknowledge by raising your right hand if you're in favor of it please say aye and raise your hand aye that's six positive votes that actually passes. Right Did I say right hand? That was his left hand. <laughs> the telling us our neighborhood is worthless. I'll have a field day at the budget hearing this April. No more taxes from me. They just ran our neighborhood into the ground. Mm. Yeah, they're, they set us up. On the other this, hand, well, I think there's another process. There's another process. Thank you. Thank you for speaking up. There is that issue. So there were three that three. Okay. Thank you. I still there, think and there are, there are there are more efforts to, there are more efforts to go through there are more rounds of this to go through well yeah yeah I mean he still has to come before us and and get approvals for a plan and your input on any proposal is still essential Thank you.
Go, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Do we need, to do we need anything else? Just a couple of things. Just, just a minute. Get the minutes. Minutes. Uh, everybody is concerned. We have people here. To approve it. All those in favor? Any comments? George. Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. Second. Thanks, Jim. All those in aye. favor, say aye. 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 What else? Anything? A copy of the town calendar for your use. Um, there is a upcoming uh, land use training session, the annual uh, event uh, at Wesleyan University, which is going to be held on March 23rd, as is our practice. If anyone wants to attend, please let me know by email and we will uh, cover the, uh, the cost for that. I think this, one, this is the all day uh, on a Saturday. So if anyone uh, has the time and the interest, um, there's some, some good speakers and then I saw some names of some not, not so good speakers. I won't name names. Yes. So, uh, uh, he might be going, might be speaking, he but uh, he is. We, don't know which side he's on. we don't know which of the good is good or the bad. There you go. <laughs> uh, the other thing is on Thursday morning, uh, we're having the annual state of the town breakfast uh, with the legislators, the town manager, superintendent of schools. So if you want to know what's going on in town, uh, that is going to be held at the country club. And I believe it starts at eight or eight thirty. If you uh, want to attend, uh, there's still uh, seats available. So. Uh, this Thursday, a, a sh little short notice, but nevertheless. And then one um, last thing that I just, I, I hate to keep you any longer because it's been such a long night, but um, we've been approached by a, an individual who wants to uh, potentially open up a brewery uh, slash brew pub. We do not have uh, specific regulations uh, relating to that, the definitions and the statutes are relatively new. I think they started that in 2012. Um, so we have nothing presently in the regulations. I'm looking for some uh, guidance. A lot of towns have recently gone through the process to adopt new regulations to regulate those kinds of activities. Um, I think that's what we are probably going to have to do since the regulations provide me with uh, very little uh, guidance. I uh, just wanted to throw that out there, um, get some reaction as to whether that seems like uh, having a brewery, brew pub in town is a good idea or a bad idea without getting into a, you know, any specific locations. There's nothing in our regulations really specific. No. It, they're kind of unusual. They're unusual kinds of uses. <laughs> some Bars and package stores and not something like that. All of that stuff, but no, not, no. not something like this because it doesn't really fit into, you know, an industrial use versus a, they have a brew pub where you can come and drink and, so you know. How do you want us to uh, give I you any thoughts we have? Anyone so have any strong uh, Are you gonna give us a draft feelings against it, at? I guess, is where we might. Draft. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you didn't even get that. <laughs> IPA. Maybe three drafts. I think there's over 80 in the state already. There should be plenty of miles. Yeah, there, there are. Yeah. So, yeah. There are. so, we'll so to the back of that train. So I can come back with a kind of a, you know, policy uh, memo telling yeah, you. Maybe if there's like a give you some guidance. Language. Yeah, I can I can do that uh, and uh, uh, get back to you before the individual. He he's not really you know nailed down a site yet, but wants to. Uh, find a, a home here in town and uh, I indicated we would bring it up with the commission. The guy up in Maple Street that's distributor. I, I cannot, I, I've been asked not to talk about who it is. So. Peter, you might also look he at. He wasn't uh, brewing it on the premises. No. You might also look <laughs> at some uh, history of, of yeah. the town prior to 
1919, which was in, when the Volstead Act came into yes. to play. And yes. I, I would suspect that there were. Maybe we could find some, some pre existing, yes. non conforming yeah, locations. Yeah. So. <laughs> we're just reestablishing past use, that's all. Right. All right, so I will uh, bring back some research. East Hartford, I think just Tuesday, uh, uh, Monday night, approved some new regulations. So there's, there's some recent examples that I we can. Rocky Hill has one. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they, they did it sort of in an industrial. They didn't create a regulation. So uh, we're finding that some towns have done that too. So just, just put it in the industrial. Yeah. Well, Rocky Hills is in. Yeah, it's in an industrial oh, building. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, I don't own this. Well, he has a tie on. So we, that's my next.